Hi, everyone, and welcome to my show called We Were Lied To About 9-11. I am your host, John Gold, and this show is part of the Soapbox People's Network. This week, we're going to focus on the lies of the FAA and NORAD with regards to the air response on the morning of 9-11. Truth and accountability is missing so much with regards to 9-11. Hi, this is John, and I'm here with Malcolm Chaddock. How are you doing today, Malcolm? I'm doing great, John. Thanks for having me on. Oh, well, thank you very much for being on today. Um, so I'm going to read Malcolm's uh, bio. Uh, shocked into activism by the ACLU's an a- analysis of the Patriot Act II, Mal Chaddock has been involved in social justice issues since 2002, first with Peace Fresno, a group that was infiltrated by the FBI and made international news, After relocating to Portland, Oregon, Mal helped co-found Oregonians Against the Wars and Individuals for Justice, which is www.individualsforjustice.com, and joined the Portland, Oregon chapter of Veterans for Peace, where he currently serves as vice president. Mal has traveled the nation extensively over the last dozen years, supporting endeavors for peace, often accompanying Peace mom, Cindy Sheehan, on her journeys in the USA. Cindy Sheehan, who's that? (laughs) Well, gee, I know nobody knows who that is, so I should... (laughs) (laughs) Um, Let me just quickly finish this. Most recently, he's been active in helping found and support No Nukes uh, NW and Redcast.org, as well as Don't Shoot Portland. Now, for those who don't know... Malcolm and I have been or taken part in a couple of Cindy's actions. The first one was um, Camp Out Now in um, Washington, D.C. in March 2010, where we were part of what we called Peace of the Action, and it was spelled P-E-A-C-E. And another... Uh, activity that we took part in together was what was called the Tour de Peace, where Cindy um, endeavored to ride her bike, her bicycle, across the country. And I got to spend about two weeks on the Tour de Peace, but I got to see some amazing things. I got to see some, meet some amazing people. Um, and it wasn't long after that that I broke my back, but one of the things that uh, the Tour de Peace did is they rerouted their um, their path, I guess, to come to Philadelphia to come visit me while I was in the hospital. And Malcolm was with Cindy at that time. So Malcolm and I know each other pretty well. And the reason that I'm having Malcolm on today, um, I did my very best. Um, or what I've done for the show is I've tried to have the experts on so as to put forward the best of the best information. And for this subject, I could not get any of the experts that I trusted. I tried to get Paul Thompson. I tried to get Shoestring from 9-11 Blogger, who says he doesn't do interviews. Um, And I tried very hard to contact John Farmer, who was... I think the, the the team investigator for the people on the 9-11 Commission who were um, investigating the FAA and NORAD's response that morning, he also wrote a book called The Ground Truth. So I couldn't get any of those people. And then what I was going to do is have my friend Eric Larson on, who was on the third show, to go over what we both knew and, you know, so on and so forth, but Eric couldn't um, pin down a time, and I wanted to get this interview over with. It's a very important subject. So what I've decided to do is have a show with someone who's who knows a little bit about the subject, but doesn't um, isn't really familiar with all of the, you know the content regarding the subject, and I wanted to see his reactions or that person's reactions as we go through this information. So Malcolm has been kind enough to be my guinea pig today. (laughs) Um, Happily. 
it should be a fun uh, a fun exercise. I'm looking forward to uh, to how it goes. All right, excellent. So what we're going to do is I'm going to start with the questions. Um, what was the day of 9/11 like for you? Well, as I recall, um, I was living in a portion of Fresno called the Tower District, which had a coffee shop I would walk down to every morning. And there was a woman there who was a school teacher who I would do crosswords with. She would toss me the ones that she couldn't get. And um, I hadn't even really sat down to the table when this gentleman spoke to her and said, did you hear about, you know, the plane flying into the World Trade Center America's under attack, and then he went into the coffee shop, and I'm looking at her like, okay, um, you know this guy, right? And she goes, well, a little bit. And I said, do you know him to be sane? And she goes, well, yeah. And I said, okay, I think I better go home and plug in that TV that hasn't been plugged in for nine months. <laughs> and it took it took a while for me to unplug it again, I'll tell you. That was a... A hell of a shock, you know, watching all that happen. And what I thought, I know this is your next question, what did I think about it or when did I first begin to suspect that there was something wrong with this whole deal? Instantly. Really? Instantly. On the day of. Well, that, oh, yeah. that's, one of the, that's one of the things that I wanted to mention today is the fact that my very first question about 9-11, and I've said this before, was on the day of 9-11, after the Pentagon was hit, I, I said to my friend, where the hell is our military? And so that's, you know, apropos for what, for what today's topic is. Yeah, there um, was such a, uh, uh, just a complete lack of response in any measured fashion. Uh, it just started to feel to me like, all this preparation that had been done over the years, all the air flight intercepts that had been carried out over the years for, you know, under much less threatening circumstances, and yet this is going on? There's something right. wrong here. Well, that's, you know, what we've been led, what we were led to believe is that, you know, our military is, is um, crackerjack people, you know, made up of crackerjack people who go up and, and intercept planes left and right and, you know, are able to monitor the skies. And, you know, that that's what we were led to believe up until well, the day of night. Ads. I remember sorry? specifically ads for the Air Force, which actually had that scenario, you know, on television. We, you know, you got to scramble sometimes, and they showed the ready crews jumping into their aircraft and being all exciting, you know, because they were recruiting. Right. And so it wasn't that that kind of thing had never been thought of before or anything like that. It was actually part of the popular culture for, you know, and, and out there as an idea, and, and, and we all knew that they did these things all the time. Well, you know, Okay, going back to the 70s, the, yeah. there were a multitude of hijackings that took place, and there was actually a hijacking, a simultaneous hijacking. I think it's called the Dawson's Field hijackings, where three or four planes were simultaneously hijacked. Um, wow. And that one yeah, no, that. you didn't know about that. Well, I didn't there know you about go. that one. Yeah. Yeah. So the, there's even, a, even a bigger deal. <laughs> right. Well, you know, there's an episode of All in the Family. I don't know, for those for you young folk, that's a TV show from the 70s, um, where Archie Bunker goes on television to talk about gun control. But during that little segment, he talks about the skyjackings and how hard, you know, how how big a problem it is and stuff like that. And that was during the 70s. Um, you know, and they happened through the 80s. So the idea that our FAA or NORAD, you know, d didn't have an idea of, of how to respond to this, it's kind of absurd, but well, it anyway. Is. It's actually kind of insulting to our intelligence, really. 
Right. It is. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> What what was what was the first specific thing that you did question about nine eleven? I think that one of the first things that I questioned about it was uh, just that I remember reading. Okay, I'm reaching back in my memory to be as absolutely truthful as I can from you know for the time. And um, what I remember was the whole thing about controlled demolition was sticking out like a sore thumb. Um, And that was just from visuals. I didn't, nobody had to tell me that that looked strange. I mean, that it looked, well, actually kind of too good. Um, The way that the planes hit and everything, it just, none of it ever made sense to me how the buildings came down. Now, I realize that that is a point of great contention amongst the people who studied this more closely. But uh, you know, as to whether it was controlled or not, or whatever. But just from just from watching how it went down, I couldn't reconcile everything that I was seeing, and it seemed to me that there was more to this than met the eye. Then I remembered also that the building had been those buildings had been attacked before you know, some years prior by a bombing. And uh, I uh, I uh, started thinking that this was uh, more of a continuum than a, than an isolated event. That's th- th- those were the impressions that I had at the time. Right. Um, the, the buildings, you know, everybody knows my stance about the buildings. I'll just repeat them really quick. I don't think you should have to be a, a physicist or a scientist or an architect or an engineer to understand the need for 9/11 justice, and it is, a, you know, a highly debated subject. There are people on both sides of the argument who make good arguments, and it's it's hard to trust. You know, <laughs> anyway, I don't really want to get into that, but. Yeah, but I, I'm with you there. I, I have questions and concerns, some of which have been adequately answered, but not all. And so in that area, the real deal is, well, why don't we find out? Well, before we you get know, into... The investigation, but anyway. Right. Um, before we get into all of the other questions, I want to read a statement. Okay. Um and as a matter of fact, because of some of the content matter that we'll be going over today during the show, I've decided to dedicate this show to 9-11 victims, Alan Kleinberg and John Casaza. Uh, Alan Kleinberg was married to Mindy Kleinberg, and John Casaza was married to Patty Casaza, two Jersey girls, um, two September 11th advocates, the the four widows responsible for the creation of the 9/11 Commission. Um, I want to dedicate this to the to their husbands because of some of the content we're going over today. So anyway, I want to start off by reading a statement by Mindy Kleinberg, 9/11 uh, victim family member Mindy Kleinberg, during the first public hearing of the 9/11 Commission, and she starts out like this. Um, With regards to the 9-11 attacks, it has been said that the intelligence agencies have to be right 100% of the time, and the terrorists only have to get lucky once. This explanation for the devastating attacks of September 11th, simple on its face, is wrong in its value, because the 9-11 terrorists were not just lucky once, they were lucky over and over again. And she goes on to talk about, prior to 9-11, FAA and Department of Defense manuals gave clear, comprehensive instructions on how to handle everything from minor emergencies to full-blown hijackings. These protocols were in place and were practiced regularly for a good reason. With heavily trafficked airspace, airliners without radio and transponder contact are collisions and or calamities waiting to happen. 
Those protocols dictate that in the event of an emergency, the FAA is to notify NORAD. Once that notification takes place, it is then the responsibility of NORAD to scramble fighter jets to intercept the errant planes or planes. It is a matter of routine procedure for fighter jets to intercept commercial airliners in order to regain contact with the pilot. In fact, between June 2000 and September 2001, fighter jets were scrambled 67 times. If that weren't protection enough, on September 11th, NEEDS, or the Northeast Air Defense System, Department of NORAD, was several days into a semi-annual exercise known as Vigilant Guardian. This meant that our Northeast Air Defense System was fully staffed. In short, key officers were manning the Operation Battle Center. Fighter jets were cocked, loaded, and carrying extra gas on board. Lucky for the terrorists, none of this mattered on the morning of 9-11. And she goes on to talk about a lot of other things, but she finishes her statement with this, and it's, it's very profound. It's always stuck with me. To me, luck is something that happens once. When you have this repeated pattern of broken protocols, broken laws, broken communication, one cannot still call it luck. If at some point we don't look to hold the individuals accountable for not doing their jobs properly, then how can we ever expect for terrorists not to get lucky again? And that is why I'm here with all of you today, because we must find the answers as to what happened that day so as to ensure that another September 11th can never happen again. Commissioners, I implore you to answer our questions. You are the generals in the terrorism fight on our shores. In answering our questions, you have the ability to make this nation a safer place and in turn minimize the damage if there is another terrorist attack. And if there is another terrorist attack, the next time our systems will be in place and working and luck will not be an issue. So that's, I wanted to read that from her. Do you have anything to say about that? I have, I, I do. I think it's a very reasoned and respectful uh statement in light of the fact that so many of the people she was talking to had knowledge that they could have used to redress the situation and have not done so. Right. Well, all right, so the first question, how many different timelines were given with regards to the air response that morning? Do you know? Oh, I know that there are like at least three or four. I mean, and, and people argue over the timing uh, by a couple of minutes on some things. So uh, it, it's compl the answer to that is complex, John. Why don't you tell me what you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, over the years, um, during the 9-11 congressional briefing um, that was chaired by then Representative Cynthia McKinney on July 22, 2005 in Washington, D.C., Paul Thompson said that he had as many as five different timelines that he had uh, collected uh, that, that we were told. But I am really only aware of three, and I'm going to I'm going to go over them because they are complex. Um, on September 13th, 2001, during the uh, confirmation hearings for then General Myers to become, I think, the, the head of the Joint Chiefs. Um, this is a part of a transcript from that session, and this is Senator Carl Levin. Uh, Levin, was the Defense Department contacted by the FAA or the FBI or any other agency after the first two hijacked aircraft crashed into the World Trade Center prior to the time that the Pentagon was hit? Myers. Sir, I don't know the answer to that question. I can get that for you, for the record. Levin, thank you. Did the, the Defense Department take, or was the Defense Department asked to take action against any specific aircraft? Myers, sir, we're Levin. And did you take action against, for instance, there has been statements that the aircraft that crashed in Pennsylvania was shot down. Those stories continue to exist. Myers, Mr. Chairman, the Armed Forces did not shoot down any aircraft. 
When it became clear what the threat was, we did scramble fighter aircraft, AWACS, radar aircraft, and tanker aircraft to begin to establish orbits in case other aircraft showed up in the FAA system that were hijacked but we never actually had to use force. Levin, was that order that you just described given before or after the Pentagon was struck? Do you know? Myers, that order, to the best of my knowledge, was after the Pentagon was struck. So later in the testimony, basically what he said was the order to scramble was not given until after the Pentagon was struck. Um, Later in the testimony, Senator Bill Nelson, I think Senator, says, uh, Nelson, the second World Trade Tower was hit shortly after 9 p.m. or 9 a.m., and the Pentagon was hit approximately 40 minutes later. That's approximately. You would know specifically what the timeline was. The crash that occurred in Pennsylvania after the Newark westbound flight was turned around 100 degrees and started heading back to Washington was approximately an hour after the World Trade Center second explosion. You said earlier in your testimony that we had not scrambled any military aircraft until after the Pentagon was hit. And so my question would be, why? And yeah. Meyer says, I think I had that right, that it was not until then. I'd have to go back and review the exact timelines. And then later in the testimony, just to, to give Myers the benefit of the doubt. Levin, the time that we don't have that we don't have is when the Pentagon was notified. If they were by the FAA or the FBI or any other agency relative to any potential threat or any planes having changed direction or anything like that. And that's the theme which you will give us because that's Myers. I can answer that. At the time of the first impact on World Trade Center we stood up our crisis action team. So that was done immediately. So we stood it up, and we started talking to the federal agencies. The time I do not know is when NORAD responded with fighter aircraft. I don't know that time. So there were two times during his testimony, he said that uh, planes were not scrambled until after the Pentagon was hit. And then later in the same testimony, he says he, he didn't know. So that, it's not an official timeline um, as, to, as to when, you know, everything happened, but it's the first indication from anybody as to when, you know, fighters were scrambled and so on and so forth. Do you have anything to say about all that stuff? Well, my first question would be, since when do you ignore two major building strikes and wait until you have a, a near threat, have a threat on the Pentagon before you lost fighters. It's a ridiculous response. I mean, right. if that's really the way that it happened, then somebody dropped the ball, not once, but on multiple occasions, opportunities to respond. Well, the agency, the, I mean, the, when, when a strike like that happens, don't, isn't that an immediate signal? It's like the FAA and everybody's like freaking out. Why in the world would it take an hour for them to even start thinking about scrambling when they'd already done it 67 times in the previous year? Well, the the first notification of hijacking, I believe, was at 8.15 that morning um, or 8.20 that morning. I don't recall. The exact time. Um, so so by think about that. There should have been jets in the air. And the the official account says that none of the the uh, planes were within uh, any of the fighter jets that morning. Like none of the jets were within distance or shooting distance of any of the planes that morning. So, um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> That's what they okay. said. Well, well that's let's pretty continue. interesting. <laughs> go on. Yeah, go on. <laughs> All right. The, the the second timeline, and this is directly from John Farmer's book, The Ground Truth. I don't have the page numbers because, unfortunately, I grabbed this stuff from uh, my Kindle reader, 
Kindle Reader, which doesn't give page numbers. All right. Major General Paul Weaver, the commanding general of the Air National Guard, which had responded on the morning of 9-11 under the command of the 1st Air Force, sought to answer some of these persistent questions. On September 14, 2001, speaking with reporters at the Pentagon, General Weaver, quote, pulling a chronology from his pocket, end quote, offered a detailed sequence of what occurred on 9-11. He stated that, that at 8.53 a.m., seven minutes after American Airlines Flight 11 had hit the North Tower of the World Trade Center, quote, two F-15 fighters from Otis Air Force Base on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, scrambled to chase the second plane that hit the Trade Center. United Airlines Flight 175, which had taken off from Boston at 8.14 a.m., and had deviated from its course, end quote. Uh, it goes on to say, General Weaver stated that the third flight, American Airlines Flight 77, took off from Dulles International Airport at 8.10 a.m., flew west for 45 minutes, then turned east, quote, whoever was flying it, end quote. General Weaver said, quote, had turned off the transponder, end quote, and the plane disappeared from radar, quote, they came back on the radar scope at 9.10 in West Virginia, end quote. The Northeast Air Defense Sector, Weaver stated, quote, scrambled F-16s that were on alert at Langley Air Force Base at 9.35. The crash happened at 9.37, end quote. It goes on to say General, General Weaver added that, quote, no National Guard or other military planes were scrambled to chase the fourth hijacked airliner, end quote. United Airlines Flight 93, which took off at 8.40 a.m. from Newark International Airport. Uh, goes on to say, it was, however, contradicted that very day by Deputy Defense Secretary, and this is important, by Deputy Defense Secretary Paul Wolfowitz appearing on public television's NewsHour with Jim Lear. Wolfowitz, when asked whether rules of engagement would have allowed the Air Force to shoot down United 93, said, quote, I think it was pretty clear at that point that that airliner was not under the pilot's control and that it was heading to do major damage. We were already tracking in on that plane that crashed in Pennsylvania, end quote. Wolfowitz stated, adding that, quote, it was the heroism of the passengers on board that brought it down, but the Air Force was in a position to do so if we had to, end quote. Um, this view, that timely notice that had been passed regarding United 93, that the fighters had been scrambled in response, that the president had issued the authorization to shoot down the plane, or to shoot the plane down, and that the, and that that order had been passed to the pilots who were tracking United 93, quickly became official orthodoxy. His assertion that by the time United 93 was heading for Washington, the fighters were tracking it, and the shoot-down authorization had been given was repeated on September 17th by Vice President Cheney during an appearance on Meet the Press. So, uh, it goes on to say, as administration officials struggled in public to explain what had happened and when, personnel from both the Department of Defense and the FAA worked to piece the story together preparing for a briefing at the White House on September 17th. And I grabbed this next part from historycommons.org. Uh, Bob Kerry will say during the 9-11 that, quote, it feels like something happened in that briefing that produced almost a necessity to deliver a story that's different than what actually happened on that day of September 11th, end quote. Um, so basically, the FAA um, and NORAD were going to give a, a briefing to the White House on September 17th about what happened. And, and in, it goes on to say further in uh, John Farmer's book, the agency's chronologies had changed by September 18th, the day after the White House briefing. On September 18th, the FAA generated another timeline. This document was for the internal use. 
The September 18th chronology identified a time for the FAA's notification of the military regarding American 77 as being 924. With regards to the FAA's notif notification of the hijacking of United 93, the FAA's September 18th chronology indicates NA. I guess it's not, not available. That same day, NORAD issued a press release concerning its actions on 9 11. NORAD's press release also identified 924 as the identification time for American 77 and cited that notification as the trigger for the scramble of the Langley fighters. Um, it goes on to say, like the FAA September 18th document, NORAD's press release of the same date lists not available as the notification time for United 93 hijacking, uh, for the United 93 hijacking. Thus, the government emerged a day after the White House briefing with a unified account of the actions of the FAA and the military regarding the final two flights, American 77 and United 93. It was, moreover, an account that fit together nicely, and this is important, that fit together nicely with the account provided publicly by Deputy Defense Secretary Wolfowitz and Vice President Cheney. Again. So, <laughs> So do you understand what happened? Basically, they had a meeting at the White House on September 17th, and the day after they released another chronology, and this one just happened to coincide with what uh, Wolfowitz and Cheney were saying. Right. Um, now, we're going to go with this. We're going to go with this, guys. I, I know that there's some confusion here, so we need to tighten it up. We're going to go with this story. <laughs> um, it goes on to say By sarcastic nature <laughs> no it's okay you know feel free say whatever you want um, it goes on to say the inspector general also considered whether, whether the FAA had been influenced by or coordinated its timeline with the NORAD effort that resulted in the September 18th press release the report concludes quote Neither DODIG's investigation nor our investigation established any direct coordination between the FAA and DOD officials regarding the chronologies, end quote. This conclusion conflicts with the Commission's staff interviews, which, as the Inspector General Office was informed, quote, confirmed that the adequacy of the notification of the military was a topic of hot debate in the days after September 11th between the FAA and the military. Jeff Griffith, the senior air traffic manager on duty at FAA headquarters on September 11th, recalled having heated conversations with General Order Arnold and others on the subject. He specifically recalled being informed by the military that their position was that no notice had been passed regarding the hijacking of United 93 before it crashed. Um, Even though he was saying, hey, wait a minute, no, we have an obligation to report, and we did it. Right. Well, basically... <laughs> yeah. Because that's what's happening here, is, is, is they're basically ignoring the fact that there's this whole chain of command set up and all these policies and procedures that say when this happens, then automatically, without question, this next thing happens. It doesn't say ask somebody if. You know, right. and and they're ignoring all this chain of notifications and, and that that would have taken place at that time, and said that it didn't happen, even though it's obvious that unless it was told, basically, unless the system is told not to operate at somewhere along its in line of command, it's going to automatically. Right, and it does it every day. Except this is why that. all of this stuff, it just blows my mind so much. You know, when I when I listen to all the more, as, as I go into specifics on the discrepancies, uh, you know, between what we have been told and what we, what we are discovering, you know, this is, this is a continuous theme. It's like, well, not only is that a lie, but it's, it's like, it's an insulting lie. Right. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's it's insulting. And, you know, one thing that has to be talked about is accountability. You know, so many 
so many lies and you know the the families have made the point several times that these people are still in positions or you know have been promoted and you know do we still want these people in their positions doing what they do if if they are you know were so horrible in 911 um well, right. yeah go ahead well, I'm just going to continue reading what he said. There are, in some, significant reasons to doubt the reliability of both inspectors general's reports. Neither finds any evidence that the FAA and DOD coordinated their efforts after 9-11 to reconstruct the story. This conclusion is refuted by the email from Connor, C-O-N-R, to Needs, discussed above, which references the sharing of information by the fact that Meads provided its logs to the FAA and by the fact that the agencies emerged on September 18th with identically erroneous notification times for American 77 and United 93. So, okay, so basically, there we are. Basically, John Farmer is uh, saying that we should doubt what the Inspector General's reports said. And on that subject, um, I'm going to read a little bit that I actually put together. <laughs> um, let's see, and this is—I think—I think this is from my uh, "The Facts Speak for Themselves" article. On August 2nd, 2006, the Washington Post reported that quote the Pentagon's initial story of how it reacted to the 2001 terrorist attacks may have been part of a deliberate effort to mislead the commission and the public, end quote. And that, quote, the 10-member commission in a secret meeting at the end of its tenure in the summer of 2004 debated referring the matter to the Justice Department for criminal investigation, end quote. Later, it was reported that NORAD's mistakes were due to, quote, inadequate forensic capabilities, end quote, end quote, poor record keeping, end quote. That's, okay. I think I, those results came from the Inspector General. Do you want to say something? Did the Inspector General explain what the hell he meant? I mean, uh, poor record keeping? I, I, first of all, the regulations are published. It's not a matter of record keeping. <laughs> you know, you, 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 you make your log entries when you're supposed to. Again, it, it's... And then, wh what was the thing he said before the poor record keeping? That one threw me because I didn't understand. Inadequate forensic capabilities. They didn't have the ability to forensically uh, look at things, I guess. You mean they couldn't open the frickin' log book and read it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> well, see, like, okay, I... This is what I remember from when I was in the military, okay? And, and sure, procedures vary from place to place and all that stuff. But in a general sense, you don't do much without logging it. It's part of your procedures. It's, it, it's, it's a, uh, a necessary evil, and it's something that you get chewed on for not doing, and it becomes part of your normal day-to-day -day life to make sure that you fill out the logs as you go so that you don't end up getting chewed on. Well, especially I mean, as something as important as the 9-11 attacks. Well, exactly. And the point I'm trying to make is that I'm just talking about day-to-day -day operations. I'm not talking about emergency situations where it's even more important. So, you know, in an office that has a really high pucker factor, stuff like that does not get ignored unless people are, as a whole, the whole culture has just gone to hell. You know, right. and... And that's possible. I mean, I w I'm not in those offices. I was in the military 30 years ago, not, you know, yesterday. But still, some things about those institutions tend not to change. When you're talking about an agency as heavily regulated, you know, as far as what you do when this happens is a place like the FAA or, the, or NORAD or any other quasi-militarily uh, structured organization, there's this huge amount of stuff that goes on where people are signing that this happened and stamping that that happened on this time and, and, and all this lack of forensic ability. What they mean is literally either they, they couldn't walk in the room and open the logbooks to read them 
or the computer equivalent these days. Or they never tried, and they're not telepathic. That's why they couldn't do it. <laughs> well, with regards to the DOD's Inspector General, on March 7, 2009, it is reported that Frank Rich of the New York Times believed, quote, that the Defense Department Inspector General's office, office's investigations over the years may have been cover-ups that were, quote, carried out in response to orders from above, end quote. He said that any report, quote, over the past five or six years during the war in Iraq, quote, end quote, may be suspect, and that, quote, there may be a much bigger story here, end quote. Um, his suspicions seem to have been confirmed in a report from Fox News's Catherine Herridge that broke on October 7, 2010. With regards to what is known as able danger, um, quote, it is made clear that, quote, at least five witnesses questioned by the Defense Department's Inspector General told, told Fox News that their statements were distorted by investigators in the final IG's report, or it left out key information, backing up assertions that lead hijacker Mohammed Atta was identified a year prior to 9-11, end quote. So basically, the DOD inspector general that looked into NORAD's lies, that looked into the story of able danger, um, basically let NORAD off the hook and said that the people of able danger were, were, were wrong, that they never identified Mohammed Atta. So we have a... We have you know, corrupt people saying, uh, talking about these lies, and the people that are investigating them are also seemingly corrupt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we now, do have a problem with that. <laughs> yeah. Now, on May 23rd, 2003, um, with regards to the 9-11 Commission, and I, get, I got this from History Commons, um, the 9-11 Commission holds a public hearing at which it takes testimony from military officials about the timeline of events on the day of 9-11. The key witness is retired Air Force General Larry Arnold, who commanded NORAD's continental U.S. region on the day of 9-11. Under questioning from Commissioner Richard Benveniste, Arnold says, quote, I believe that to be a fact that 9-24 was the first time that we had been advised of, of American 77 as a possible hijacked airplane, end quote. However, the commission will later conclude that the military was not notified of the hijacking at this time, although it had been mistakenly advised Flight, 7, flight 11 was inbound to Washington three minutes previously. Arnold adds that if the military was slow in responding to Flight 77, it was because, quote, our focus, you've got to remember that there's a lot of other things going on simultaneously here, was on United 93, end quote. However, Flight 93 was not hijacked until a few minutes after 924. Arnold adds, quote, it was our intent to intercept United Flight 93, and in fact, my own staff, we were orbiting now over Washington, D.C. by this time, and I was personally anxious to see what 93 was going to do, and our intent was to intercept it, end quote. However, the commission will later uh, conclude that the military did not learn that Flight 93 had been hijacked until around 10 a.m. Prior to the hearing, the commission staff had concern about the inaccuracy of timelines offered by the military. Author Philip Sheenan will write, quote, it seemed all the more remarkable to Commissioner Staff, Staffer John Farmer that the Pentagon could not establish a, a clear chronology of how it responded to an attack on the Pentagon building itself. Wouldn't the generals and admirals want to know why their own offices, their own lives had been put at risk that morning, end quote? Therefore, Farmer thought that the hearing should clear things up, but according to Sheenan, he and his colleagues are, quote, astonished, end quote, when they analyze what Arnold says, although he is not under oath on this day. <laughs> Sheenan will add, 
quote, it would later be determined that almost every one of those assertions by General Arnold in May 2003 was flat wrong, end quote. Anything to say? Well, I, my, my, hmm. I would sure hate to be a general who is so ill-informed by his staff as this poor man. It would, it, would seem, <laughs> <laughs> it would seem to me that they, they all must be incompetent and just had never learned how to do their jobs properly to fail so spectacularly, and his daily life must have been hellish. <laughs> well, what I think they did is they took the timeline that was established the day after 9-11 and tried to repeat that during the 9-11 commission. That's what I think they did. And, you know, at that point, I think... Um, the tapes, they were looking at the tapes, uh, the 9-11 Commission was, and and so they, they, they knew that things were not what we were told. Now, exactly. the third time... And, and that's, why I was, that's why my sarcastic response, because quite honestly, the only way those circumstances could have obtained is if, it, if nobody came to work. I mean... It's just... <laughs> right. Now, the, the third timeline is just very simple. Um, during June... 2004 testimony um, to the 9-11 Commission, I believe the third timeline is introduced, and that's the final timeline. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I mentioned earlier Bob Carey saying that the September 17th meeting, you know, it seemed like something happened at that meeting that caused almost a necessity to put forward something different from what the, mm-hmm. the truth was. Yeah. Um, he actually, when I watched the clip of him saying that, he praised the military and and was harping on the FAA. So I I don't quite understand, you know. What was his position at the time again? He, he said that there was a meeting so, I mean, that could it be this when he was when he was doing this. Who he was working for the 9/11 Commission. Yeah, this is 9/11 Commissioner Bob Kerry. Okay. Um, he said that during the June 2004 testimony um, from NORAD, I think it took place on September, or I'm sorry, June 17th, 2004. June 16th and June 17th, 2004. Mm-hmm. So, um, now, so those are all the timelines. Those are three that I'm aware of. The next question in our little line up here. And that took a long time. What was the protocol for intercepting an errant plane? Um, do you have any Actually, ideas? Do you know? your, well, your previous uh, your statement from uh, the 9/11 widow actually covered it pretty well. I mean, when somebody's out of line, they try to. It, my understanding is, and I'm not a pilot, but you know, my, since you asked, my basic understanding of it is. If you wander off flight plan, they immediately try to contact you. If they can't contact you, they immediately scramble somebody to get up there and see what the hell's going on. And that's about how it goes. I mean, I don't think that there's a lot of waiting around or deciding whether or not he looks like he's flying straight or, <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, right. They just send somebody to investigate, and it's automatic. Right. Well, here's what I got, and I, I think... I either got this from the 9-11 report itself or from John Farmer's book. I don't remember. I'm sorry. There were established protocols in place on 9-11 for the interaction of the FAA with the military. Those protocols had been developed in response to the hijackings of the 1970s and 1980s, which typically resulted in hostage negotiations. And although... They had been revised at Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld's direction to increase his authority over the process. Those revisions to the protocols reflected none of the intelligence uh, reporting with respect to the increased domestic hijacking threat or the growing prevalence of suicide terrorist attacks. The protocols in place called for the officials in the FAA's Washington's Operations Center to notify FAA senior leadership, specifically the FAA, quote, hijack coordinator, end quote, who was, quote, the director of the FAA Office of Civil Aviation Security, or his or her designate, end quote. 
the FAA's hijack coordinator, in turn, was required to make, quote, direct contact, end quote, with the National Military Command Center, or the NMCC, at the Pentagon and, quote, request the military to provide an escort aircraft, end quote. The purpose of the military escort under the protocols existing on 9-11 was, quote, to follow the flight, report anything unusual, and aid search and rescue in the event of an emergency, end quote. Once the official request was received from the FAA, the MCC was required to seek approval from the Office of the Secretary of Defense, OSD, to provide military assistance. Now, th this seems weird to me um, that they talk about protocols, um, what they're supposed to do, and um, I don't know, like, they talk about a hijacking coordinator. Uh -huh. And it seems to me that, you know, if a flight goes off path or the radios don't respond, those are, you know, the reasons enough to send up a, a fighter jet, you know, and you don't need a hijack coordinator to do this. You know what I mean? Like, no, that's true. I, I understand what you're saying. They would just be notified as a matter of course rather than be part of the decision tree, I think. Right. To, to have to I mean, go to you know, a hijack. At that level about, you know, whether we scramble or not or whatever, that wouldn't that wouldn't actually be as purview. Well, here's a statement. I'm sorry, could you repeat that, whatever you just said? Well, I just thought a hijacking coordinator wouldn't necessarily make any kind of decision as to whether to scramble or not. I think that's automatic. The way you described it, you'd be contacted as part of the alert, but don't they scramble anyway? Well, you know, how do you know it's a hijacking? Why do you need a hijack coordinator? Oh, and, oh and well, that would just be just in case. I mean, honestly, they, they already had to deal with the scenario so many times that, you know, putting that out there as part of the no notification, it would just be automatic. During the 70s and 80s, it happened a lot uh, that they actually needed, you know, I mean, it was it was going on a lot, so you'd be, like, notified even if they didn't have action. Well, the, the, a lot of emphasis has been put on the hijacking coordinator, and I'm going to get to that in a second. But first okay. I want to read um, a statement from 9-11 family member Patty Casaza, and this took place in November 2007 um, at an event that I don't remember the name of. I was there. It, uh -huh. There's a video of it online. You just go look for Bob McElveen and Patty Casaza. All right, quote, basically from the outset, oh, Patty Casaza, just so everybody knows, she's one of the Jersey girls, and I think I mentioned that earlier. Um, so let me read what she said, quote, basically from the outset, the planes, they didn't follow protocol. There should have a uh, plane sent to accompany the commercial airliners once transponder, which is the identification the FAA uses to track planes, once that went off, that's in itself reason enough for fighter jets to be sent up into the air. And it's not on, they're, but not, they're not, their purpose is, isn't necessarily to shoot down an errant plane. That's the last resort. But they do have the means to, um, they're supposed to go on the side of the plane, lock their wings. That's an indicator that the pilot should turn some type of communication on with the, these fighter jets, let them know that everything's okay on board that, you know, there isn't a hijacking or a pilot hasn't, you know, gotten sick. Um, all of those things can happen without you shooting down a plane. And those okay. jet fighters could rock their wings. They could actually knock, if there were hijackers actually flying those planes, they could have knocked those people um, off their feet. So there were many protocols that were not followed on 9-11. And that's with four commercial jet airliners having been hijacked. I ask you, how is that possible? We spend more money in military than more, than more than half the countries totaled in the world. And again, we couldn't get one plane up in time to accompany those four planes that were wildly off course, end quote. Yeah, so, I agree with her. Right. Uh, she, 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 I'm assuming they looked into what the protocols were. Um, 
and it sounds like they did because I've heard that before. Yeah, I mean, like I said, that thing with the hijacking coordinator, that's they that's like being an on-call uh, guy, like a, the second anesthetist. You right. know, you get a notification that there's something coming in and you're waiting for chair number one to indicate that he's filled, you know, right. so you don't have to come in yourself, you know, or something well, like that. I mean, it would be it would be along those lines or, or you're, you know, hey, we may have a hijacking. You might want to check in with your secretary, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're sorry, this, is, this isn't a lasting matter, but it's just so ridiculous. No, but, you know, that's why I use the humor. Because, honestly, John, if I had to approach every single thing that you and I deal with on a daily basis, on a totally serious level, they'd have already cuffed and stuck me and put me in a little bouncy house. Right. Exactly. Um all right, so I have so some information. People think I, you know, I don't want people to think I'm being flipped because this doesn't mean anything to me. I, I would hate to give that impression. The humor is totally a matter of self-preservation. Oh, I hope you're getting angry is what I'm hoping. <laughs> well, dude, the anger, my anger meter has been pegged for about 13 years now. Okay, so well, it's going to get worse as we go along, I guarantee you. <laughs> Only on um, the daily fluctuation scale, believe me. <laughs> all right, so let me Let's go. let me get into this hijacking coordinator. Um, okay. The hijack coordinator, FAA's Office of Civil Aviation Security Director, Mike Canavan, and this is from History Commons, is in Puerto Rico and claims to have missed out on quote everything that transpired that day. End quote. The 9/11 Commission. Huh? Okay, go on, go on, go on. The 9-11 Commission fails to ask him if he had delegated that task to anyone else while he was gone. Monty <laughs> Belger will later say simply that, uh, quote, an FAA security person, end quote, runs the, quote, hijack net, end quote, open communication system during 9-11. Now, uh, according to Miles Cara, who was a staffer on the 9-11 Commission, who somebody who's turned into a 9-11 debunker, and what I think is, is an apologist for the 9-11 Commission. But anyway, according to him, Lynn Osmus was acting uh, hijacking coordinator that day, but she was out sick on 9-11, so the role was left to Claudio Mano, and it's not clear what he did in, the, in that role. So what I did is I went to the memoranda for the record, which is descriptions of interviews um, by the 9-11 Commission of individuals they talked to. And this is a quote from the Claudio Mano MFR memoranda for the record. Quote, man went to ACI's third floor watch office. He said his role was to support operations with what information he could. ACI was not able to provide any relevant intelligence information on the plot as it was unfolding, end quote. And quote, man indicated that they did not conceive that hijackers would use the aircraft as a weapon of mass destruction. So <laughs> I, I think I took pick that quote out because of how many people said that. After 9-11, nobody could talk, nobody could conceive of it. Yeah, I mean, hey, I was a kid during the 70s, but I remember all this stuff. And, and when they said that, I, I just, I, I, it was another one of those snorts of disbelief, you know. The, right, that was my, nobody conceived of it. that I could form, it was just like, are you kidding me? Okay, you're older than I am, and I remember this stuff. What happened to you? Right. I mean, and, and there have been multiple books written that, that make that scenario. I mean, if if people that write books or people that make TV shows are or have better imaginations than those deemed to protect us, there's a problem there. <laughs> well, absolutely correct. And as a matter of fact, I happen to remember from some of these things that, that media or, or did have the capability to move the government in the right direction or at least shake them up a little bit, 
Do you remember um, Independence Day, the movie? Where yeah, sure. Uh, they CGI'd the president so well, and none of it was, like, taken from stock, apparently. Uh, they just, you know, redid it. Uh, the uh, Department of Defense showed up down at the, uh, the film studio asking them, how did you do that? <laughs> right. All of a sudden, we're a little worried about this. <laughs> That's interesting. Well, um, there was a TV show. Oh, geez, what the hell was it called? It was a spinoff from the X Files, or the Lone Gunman. Yeah, and I that show. in a few months prior to 9/11, they released the pilot episode, and the pilot episode talks about hijacking a commercial aircraft remotely um, and crashing it directly into the World Trade Center, and that was the premise of the whole show. Oh, well, that's very um, very freaky. Yeah, well, it was a coincidence. It was taped like like a year before the, the the it was aired, so it was very weird to see that. Wow, yeah, that's kind of eerie. I mean, you know, these ideas are not obviously not the province of just one group of people. You can have the same fantasy and be in a completely different world. Um, that's amazing. Well, I, I don't want to say that. Um, I no, think I don't think it had a. Yeah, no, I, I don't I, either. I, just the eerie I, similarity to the to the fact that it happened a year later that a plane flew into a building. Remote control? Yeah, yeah I don't think so. But whatever. Yeah. Right. It just the goes to show eerie. how ridiculous the notion is that nobody conceived of it. And and there have been multiple people in government that have made statements that said, "Sure, we thought of that." So of it's a it's ridiculous. Anyway. Yeah. Um. The Lynn Osmus MFR, um, who was somebody I think Miles Carr said was the hijacking coordinator, I, it says, quote, Claudia Mano called her to say an aircraft was off route and headed toward New York City. Um, Osmus was in her basement and didn't hear the call. Man called back just after the first aircraft struck the World Trade Center. Osmus estimated that it was between Mano's First and second calls to her, end quote. Quote, um, when asked who the FAA's hijack coordinator was, Osmus indicated that it was Lee Longmire who was ACO1, but that there was nothing for him to do, or really nothing for him to do. Osmus stated that she does not remember any other plots that day that were confirmed, end quote. So now we got to go to somebody else's MFR to find out you know, the hijack coordinator, uh, Lee, Lee Longmire, and this is from his MFR. It says, quote, Longmire reported that it was primarily his responsibility to coordinate FAA's response to a hijacking with ACS-1, Canavan, who was missing that day in Puerto Rico, working primarily with higher-level administration officials, including the Secretary of Transportation. With respect to the military, Longmire indicated that it was standard procedure to pull the military into the communications link as soon as possible so they could monitor the aircraft. Um, in parentheses, it says he did not recall any pre-9-11 discussions of assigning the military with any hijacking role other than tracking the hijack, uh, other than tracking the aircraft, uh, in parentheses. The link-up from the FAA Command Center was supposed to be with the National Military Command Center, the NMCC. It was Longmire's expectation that both MC, the MCC and the FBI should have been included in the communications link as soon as the command center was stood up. He later learned that this didn't occur, but wasn't sure when the situation was rectified. The FAA watch was responsible for setting up the communications network. As to the taping of uh, command center communications on 9-11, Longmire reported that the center was new and he was not sure if they had the capability, uh, end quote. Um, now, I don't see any mention of Claudio Mano uh, in the 9-11 report except for his title and references to him in the notes. His memorandum for the record doesn't say anything about being the hijack coordinator um, for that day. The 9-11 report 
briefly mentions the hijack coordinator when describing what protocol was, but that's it. Um, Lee Longmire is mentioned in two notes in the back of the book, and Liz, Lynn Osmus isn't mentioned at all um, in the 9-11 report. So the hijacking coordinator, the first guy, was missing. The second person who was supposed to take over for that was out sick that day. Um, I think the third person said that the fourth person was the actual hijacking coordinator that day, and I, I, it's unclear as to what they did. Now, um, may I ask a, a question? Sure, how go ahead. Compare to, how does this compare to the, if you if you looked, how does this compare to the uh, MFRs around other investigations of hijackings and stuff? Does, I mean, does well, it, I don't, I, I don't does know. It like, does it sound like it's like, oh, I, I guess what I'm getting at is, I wonder if there's someone on the record to look and, and ascertain this, but I'd, I'd be pretty sure that most of the time your responses don't look like this. Your, your, it's, it's hard to understand. I mean, when you look at, unfortunately, when you look at most government investigations that have taken place over the years, most of them seemingly are corrupt. So, you know, it's business as usual with the, the 9-11 Commission, unfortunately. Okay. Um, I, can, I can go there, yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I have a quote, and I think I got this from History Commons. Uh, apparently, there is only one person at FAA headquarters who is authorized to request military assistance. And Ben Sliney, the command center's national operations manager, is told that no one can find him, the hijacking coordinator. Okay, so Sliney, what did you say again? Huh? Oh, ben Sliney. Sliney? S L I N is a Nancy E Y. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sliney, Sliney will later recount, quote, I said something like, that's incredible. There's only one person. There must be someone designated or someone who will assume the responsibility of issuing an order. You know, we were becoming frustrated in our attempts to get some information. What was the military's response? Um, so they, they apparently couldn't find this hijack coordinator, and, and, and so they're saying that that caused some of the problems with the air response that morning. Ugh. And this this story, I, this... I'm if, sorry, go if ahead. It's, if it's true, it's such monumental incompetence as to, as to be unbelievable. I, I, it, I just can't buy that this many things could go wrong at once, it, it, right. it's not credible because they do this every day. <laughs> yep, they train for it, they prepare for it, they're gung ho about it. If they, you know, look, you know how military and, people are. Yes, absolutely. I cannot imagine. I mean, it's one thing when you're talking about, you know, manning a guardhouse you know, over a space of 30 years, things might get a little lax. But this is real-time stuff that they do every day. They actually, you know, use the communication channels. They actually fuel the jets and fly them. <laughs> it happens all the time. So why today, this particular day, why so much failure? It's just, right. It is literally to be incredible. So much, quote, incompetence on one day. Now, I'm going to go over a subject a lot of people might not be aware of. I think you're aware of this. Um, the destruction of tapes of an interview yeah. by FAA people um, on the day of 9-11. <laughs> this is an absolute, absolutely amazing story. And I'm going to read, I'm going to have to read so people understand what this is. Um, yeah, do that, do that. I couldn't do it justice anyway. <laughs> All right, this is from the Associated Press on February 18, 2005. Quote, air traffic controllers who handled two of the hijacked flights on September 11, 2001, recorded their experiences shortly after the planes crashed into the World Trade Center 
but a supervisor destroyed the tape, government investigators said Thursday, end quote. Uh, quote, sometime between December 2001 and February 2002, an unidentified Federal Aviation Administration uh, quality assurance manager crushed the cassette case in his hand, cut the tape into small pieces, and threw them away in multiple trash cans, the report said, end quote. <laughs> Um, another report, and this is from, I believe, the New York Times. Quote, the Inspector General, Kenneth M. Meade, said that officials keeping the existence of the tape a secret and the decision by one to destroy it had not served, quote, the interests of the FAA, the department, or the public, end quote, and could foster suspicions among the public, end quote. Um, oh, really? No, just get out. Suspicious? <laughs> I can't imagine. It doesn't seem suspicious to me, but okay. Quote, the quality assurance manager told investigators that he had destroyed the tape because he thought making it was contrary to FAA policy, which calls for written statements, and because he felt that the controllers, quote, were not in the correct frame of mind to have properly consented to the taping, end quote. Because of the stress of that day, Mr. Meade reported, quote, the quality assurance manager destroyed the tape between December 2001 and February 2002. By that time, he and the center manager had received an email message sent by the FAA instructing officials to safeguard all records and adding, quote, if a question arises whether or not you should retain data, retain it, end quote. The, the inspector general attributed the tape's destruction to, quote, poor judgment. Quote, an FAA spokesperson, Greg Martin, said that his agency had cooperated with the 9-11 Commission, and that was how the tape's existence had become known at the agency's headquarters. Quote, we believe it would not have added in any way to the information contained in all of the other materials that have already been provided to the investigators and the members of the 9-11 Commission, he said. Nonetheless, Mr. Martin said, quote, we have taken appropriate disciplinary action, end quote, against the quality assurance manager. For privacy reasons, he said, he could not say what those actions were or identify any of, any of the employees involved. And that's from the New York Times, May 6, 2004. And I have one more report to go over that gets into specifics as to who these people are. Um, the center manager, Mike McCormick, asked six controllers involved to participate in the making of the cassette tape recording, providing their first-hand accounts of the morning's actions, interacting with or tracking the two hijacked airplanes. McC McCormick knew that the six would have to prepare written statements, but those writings might not be undertaken until the controllers return from stress-induced sick, sick leave. He was seeking an immediate, quote, contemporaneous recording, end quote, which could assist the controllers later in the preparing their written statements. The tape also could assist law enforcement officials who might have an immediate need for controller information about the hijackings. The Department of Transportation Inspector General considered the manager's taping initiative quote, prudent under the circumstances, end quote. McCormick coordinated this initiative with the controller's local union president. The local union president agreed to the taping on the condition that the taping was temporary and that the tape was to be destroyed when standard written statements were obtained. This agreement was never relayed to the proper authorities. After the recording session, the tape was handed to Kevin Delaney, the center's quality assurance manager. Its existence was entered into the center's evidence law. However, neither Delaney nor McCormick informed FAA regional or national headquarters authorities of the tape's existence or of their separate agreement with the union to destroy it. If higher authorities had been aware of the tape, it would have been regarded as an original record requiring five-year retention the Department of Transportation Inspector General said. Um, 
September 14th, the center received a regional email directing that all data and records for September 11th be retained and secured. The email stressed, quote, if a question arises whether or not you should retain the data, retain it. If any questions, please call, end quote. Delaney told the Department of Transportation Inspector General investigators he believed the email did not apply to the tape recorded statements since higher headquarters were unaware of its existence. Okay. Whether higher authorities were aware or not, whether the tape was a temporary or permanent record is immaterial according to experienced criminal investigators. Um, December 2001 and February 2002. Sometime during this period, Delaney, acting on his own initiative, destroyed the tape by breaking up the plastic housing and cutting the tape into small fragments, depositing the remnants in trash cans throughout the center. McCormick told Department of Transportation Inspector General investigators if Delaney had asked permission to destroy the tape, he would have granted it. As a former criminal investigator remarked, quote, blind musician Ray Charles could see this was a cover-up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and it goes on to say, as a result of the judgments rendered by these managers, no one will know for certain the content of the tape or its intrinsic value, nor be able to compare the audio tape statements with the controller's written statements one of which was prepared three weeks later for purposes of ensuring completeness. Uh, the technical details of the hijacked flights are well known based on radar data and pilot controller radio communications. What those six controllers recounted in a group setting on September 11th in their own voices about what transpired that morning are no longer available to assist any investigation or inform the public. And it finally says, in late April, McCormick was suspended for 20 days without pay. He appealed the action. Disciplinary action is still under consideration for Delaney, an official at FAA headquarters said. And that's um, from Aviation Today on May 17, 2004. So <laughs> we didn't know their names for a while, finally. We, we got their names. And I looked uh, at the 9-11 Commission to see if they spoke with these people. And I found that they did speak with Delaney, the guy who destroyed the tape. Yeah. And this is from his memorandum for the record. It says, quote, Delaney stated prior to 9-11, nobody would have anticipated someone hijacking an aircraft and crashing it into a building. Again, I got that quote because it's one we heard a lot. Um, and this is the second part uh, of what I got from his NFR. In subsequent interviews with two or ZNY employees, commission staff gathered information that contradicts Delaney's statements. Please see commission MFRs from Michael o. McCormick and David LaCates for further information. So they're saying that he, there's, you know, there's contradictory statements to what Delaney is saying, the guy who destroyed the tapes. But I don't know what, what it's with regards to. I did not look up Michael McCormick and David LaCate's MFRs. I'm sorry to say. Well, that's okay. It's certainly something to look at next. Yeah, uh, for for people interested. Yeah. Um. Now. There's one thing I'm going to go over with regards to the FAA. Um, you recall that Condoleezza Rice, or you recall that we were told there were no warnings of any kind. Oh, I remember like her saying it and just yelling at the computers. <laughs> well, not not just her, but after 9/11, oh, there were a multitude of people. Yeah, yeah, and it was it made me yell every time, nearly. <laughs> Right. Okay. So what I did was, as I went, there was a a monograph released by the 9/11 Commission after the release of the 9/11 report, and I got this directly from HistoryCommons. Um, dot org. April 1st, 2001, September 10th, 2001. Nearly 
uh, I'm sorry, between April 1st, 2001 and September 10th, 2001, nearly half of the FAA's daily intelligence summaries mention bin Laden or Al-Qaeda, and no action is taken. And I'm going to read this, this entry. In 2005, it will be revealed that of the FAA's 105 daily intelligence summaries between these dates, 52 mention bin Laden, al-Qaeda, or both. Most of the mentions are, quote, in regard to overseas threats, end quote. None of the warnings specifically predict something similar to the 9-11 attacks, but five of them mention al-Qaeda's training for hijackings and two rep reports concern suicide operations unconnected to aviation. One of the warnings mentions air defense measures being taken in Genoa, Italy, for the G July 2001 G8 summit to protect from a possible air attack by terrorists. However, the New Jersey Ledger is virtually the, the only newspaper in the U.S. to report this fact. Despite all these warnings, the FAA fails to take extra or any extra security measures. They do not expand the use of in-flight air marshals or tighten airport screening for weapons. A proposed rule to improve passenger screening and other security measures ordered by Congress in 1996 is held up and is still not in effect by 9-11. The 9-11 Commission's report on these FAA warnings released in 2005 will conclude that FAA officials were more concerned with reducing airline congestion, lessening delays, and easing air carriers' financial problems than preventing a hijacking. The FAA also makes no effort to expand its list of terror suspects, which includes only a dozen names. The former head of the FAA Civil Aviation Security Branch Later says he wasn't even aware of tip-off, the government's main watch list, which included the names of two 9-11 hijackers before 9-11. Nor is there any evidence that a senior FAA working group responsible for security ever meets in 2001 to discuss, quote, the high threat period that, that summer, end quote. So basically, the FAA got 52 warnings having to do with bin Laden before 9-11 in a short time frame. And on 9-11, seemingly no one was prepared for what happened that day. You right. know, proto the, the protocols were not followed that day. And the protocols that had been developed, by the way, over literally decades. Decades. I mean, these are things that people, like I said, I keep on coming back to this. They did it every day. Right. You know, um, stuff. Uh, some of these things, these other uh, things that tie this person to that person in the whole scenario that you and I have discussed before, not just the air part, but, you know, just the whole general sweep of it indicates that there, there was a whole lot more to it than as a one-off. But anyway. Right. All right, so the next question that we have, um, and I know that you won't be able to answer this, but I have something. Um, give or take, how many times prior to 9-11 were, were planes intercepted? Well, I know that um, you had read previously, but total, no idea. No idea. Well, I went to historycommons.org, and I got a list of scrambles or... Up, uh, reports of scrambles, so I'm just going to go ahead and read them. A General Accounting Office report published in May 1994 states that, quote, during the past four years, NORAD's alert fighters took off to intercept aircraft referred to as, as scrambled 1,518 times or an average of 15 times per site per year, end quote. Of these incidents, the number of scrambles that are in response to suspected drug smuggling aircraft averages, quote, one per site uh, or less than 7% of all of the alert sites, total activity, end quote. The remaining activity, about 93% of the total scrambles, quote, generally involved visually inspecting unidentified aircraft 
and assisting aircraft in distress, end quote. Um, in the two years from May 15, 1996, to May 14, 1998, NORAD's Western Air Defense Sector, WADS, which is responsible for the, quote, air sovereignty, end quote, of the Western 63% of the continental United States scrambles fighters 129 times to identify unknown aircraft that might be a threat. Over the same period, WAD scrambles fighters an additional 42 times against potential and actual drug smugglers. Um, in 1997, the Southeast Air Defense Sector, SEEDS, another of NORAD's three air defense sectors in the, in the continental U.S., tracks 427 unidentified aircraft, and fighters intercept these, quote, unknowns, um, end quote, 36 times. The same year, NORAD's Northeast Air Defense Sector needs handles 65 unidentified tracks, and WADS handles 104 unidentified tracks, according to Major General Larry Arnold, the commander of the continental United States NORAD region on 9-11. In 1998, SEEDS logs more than 400 fighter scrambles. In 1999, Airman Magazine reports that NORAD's fighters on alert at Homestead Air Reserve Base in Florida are scrambled 70 to 75 times per year on average, according to Captain, Captain Tom Herring, a full-time alert pilot at the base. This is more scrambles than any other unit in the Air National Guard. Um, according to the Calgary Herald, in 2000 there are 425, quote, unknowns, where an aircraft's pilot has not filed or deviated from a flight pan, or has deviated from a flight pan, or has used the wrong radio frequency, and fight, fly, ugh, fighters are scrambled 129 times in response. Between September 2000 and June 2001, fighters are scrambled 67 times to intercept suspicious aircraft, according to the Associated Press. Um, Lieutenant General Norton Schwartz, the commander of the Alaskan NORAD region at the time of, nine, of the 9-11 attacks, will say that before 9-11 it is, quote, not unusual and certainly was a well-refined procedure, end quote, for NORAD fighters to intercept an aircraft. He will add, though, that intercepting a commercial airliner is, quote, not normal. So apparently... Um, We've intercepted a few aircraft before, and we apparently knew what we were doing. Yeah. Um, the uh, it, that one Air Force base in the spirit, in a year did seventy five. That, <laughs> right. That's that's yep. nearly two a week. I mean, <laughs> just that one base. Wow. That's uh, yeah. We didn't just have some experience at this. Right. Yeah, exactly. It, it's something we do every day. So why 9-11 did all of that fail? Well, we definitely need that new investigation. Anyway, go on. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is, what was NORAD's mission? And I forget where I got this from. I think it was from John Farmer's book. Uh, I, I don't remember. I wish I wrote it down. During the early 19... Uh, 90s, NORAD's mission consequently changes from one of air defense to one of meaning, quote, maintaining, air, quote, air sovereignty, end quote, which NORAD defines as, quote, providing surveillance and control of the territorial airspace, end quote. The new mission includes intercepting suspicious aircraft, tracking hijacked aircraft, assisting aircraft in distress, and counter drug operations. As this change takes place, the number of aircraft defending American airspace is reduced. In 1987, there are 52 fighters on alert in the continental United States. But by December 1999, there are just 14 alert fighters remaining around the, U the continental United States. So their mission was to take care of our airspace, essentially. The air sovereignty... Um, 
you know, was their mission. That, so, anyway, um, during the 9-11 Commission on June 17, 2004, 9-11 Commissioner Jamie Gorlick will question General Myers about NORAD's mission. Quote, in my experience, the military is very clear about its charters and who is supposed to do what. So if you go back and you look at the foundational documents for NORAD, they do not say defend us only against the threat coming in from across the ocean or across our borders. It has two missions, and one of them is control of the airspace above the domestic United States, and airspace control is defined as providing surveillance and control of the airspace of Canada and the United States. To me, that air sovereignty concept means that you have the role which, if you were postured only externally, you defined outside the job, end quote. And right. quote, I would like to know as the second question, is it your job, and if not, whose job is it to make current assessments of a threat and decide whether you are positioned correctly to carry out a mission, which at least on paper, nor had had, end quote. And at the end of this exchange, um, General Myers asks, quote, did I answer both questions, end quote. And Jamie Gorlick says, quote, yes and no, and my time has expired, <laughs> end quote. Well, <laughs> um, according to information collected by somebody by the name of Dean Jackson, NORAD's mission at the time coincided with uh, Jimmy Gorlick's understanding of it. Okay, so basically um, what NORAD did is they told people that they were looking outward, that their responsibility was to monitor things coming into the United States, not what was happening within the United States. Which is of course, just completely a lie. It's just completely wrong. It, <laughs> right. They're, they're and, mission, yeah. It's just that's that's that they left out half of what they do. Right. Um so basically the next question is a quick one and I don't have to do much reading for it, thank God. Um, NORAD told the 9-11 Commission that they were looking outward, meaning they were only monitoring things coming into the United States. Is this true or not? So, um, basically, I looked at one of the MFRs for Colonel Robert Marr, who was in charge of needs that day, and on his MFR, um, they make... He makes, I think he makes the argument that they were looking outward. And it says, quote, Commission staff presented to Marr that the flights that were hijacked on 9-11 were within physical capabilities of the radar needs is linked to, end quote. Right. So <laughs> that, that kind of tells them that you're full of crap. Right, and the fact that they they bothered even to write it is like saying, we know this guy is full of crap. <laughs> well, one of the things that uh, Colonel Robert Moore did, and, and this is presented in the MFR of his, it says, quote, Moore conceded that the NORAD presentation to the public of the events of 9-11 does not meet the fidelity of the commission investigations, end quote. So, oh, so he basically said, "Yes, we are lying, and uh, we 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 know that." <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, we're lying. We know it. Um, yeah, but uh, he did. And <laughs> isn't this unbelievable? Like how ridiculous this is at this point. Well, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, it 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 is ridiculous, and it's it it's. Uh, the level of dysfunction necessary to pro or corruption necessary to produce this kind of situation ought to scare the crap out of people. Right. I mean, it really it, should. It, you know, but we live with it every day. I think folks have almost gotten to think of this as normal somehow. Well, that that's a problem, you know, that this Boy, world, this, this post-9-11 world um, is is becoming the norm. And that's scary to me. Yeah, and it's one of the reasons that I, I do what I do. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want 
this to be the norm. I don't want all of these wars to be the norm. I don't want kids growing up thinking this is the norm. You um, know? I hear you big time. All right, the next question says, we were told that the military exercises that were taking place that morning gave us a better response time. Um, by all indications, is that true? And did the military exercises cause confusion? Do you well, know about this? I know that the military exercises in general can cause confusion because of overlap, but they're different systems in a way. I mean, the the notional control of the gaming and all that is is off by itself. Uh, the outside, I, I think that there has to be trackers when you're talking about something that major from the bigger agencies. I mean, joint staff has to con, con, consult with all these other agencies in order to avoid, you know, making horrible things happen like air crashes and that. Um, so, you know, there should have been eyes. There should have been eyes out, actually. To me, it would almost seem that if people had been operating with their, uh, you know, if they had been operating according to procedures and according to the the way that the, 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 uh, gosh, the, um, the general way that they operate in, in a normal day, which is to aggressively pursue their mission, that they would have actually responded more quickly in some ways or more creatively, rather because they already had people in the air. I mean, well, I don't my, know that that's imp I don't know that that's an easy thing to do. But what I'm saying is, I don't discount that as a possibility. I don't necessarily think it would muddle things. It it, it might have helped in a way if people had had their eyes on. I don't know. Well, let's talk about. Um you know, I've always said that they said that the, the military exercises that were taking place that day helped their response, and yet at the same time, they didn't manage to intercept any of the planes. So I I don't see that. Um, this is what's interesting, because on any normal day, they would send them after a target, uh, you know, and then observe their, their flight track and see whether they were on it or not and say, wait a minute, you're not going the right way. My understanding is that there were flights that were sent in the exact opposite of the direction that they needed to go and such. Is, yes. that, is that correct? Well, there were planes that were sent over the ocean, and they were they were sent there for a holding pattern, and they stayed there for a while. I, I don't exactly, again, unfortunately, I'm not an expert on this subject. I wish I was. I, I'm, you know, I know more than a lot of people, but I'm not an expert. Yeah. I don't know. It's such a convoluted story. And I was yeah. talking to to um, Lori Van Auken, 9-11 family member Lori Van Auken about this. It is such a convoluted story to try and uh -huh. understand. Well, yeah. I think one of the big deals is that it seems like the obfuscators are banking on the fact that people don't really understand how things operate in the military sector right. and, and the frequency, like you said. I mean, you're bringing up these facts of how often it really does happen um, and that it's a way of life for some people and they understand it intimately and that the thing that happened on 9-11 really shouldn't be possible, you know. Right. So I want to uh, get into but these... The general public doesn't know that. Right. I want to get into these military exercises um, because okay. I think they're very important. And there were military exercises taking place a little bit um, before 9-11 in late August and early September, and they were called red flag exercises. And this is directly from historycommons.org. In late August and early September 2001, members of the 121st Fighter Squadron of the District of Columbia Air National Guard, DCANG, D-C-A-N-G, participate in the red flag training exercises in Nevada. They do not return from it until September 8th. Red flag is held four times a year at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada. It is usually composed of two or three week periods. The timing of the red flag exercise may reduce the ability of the DCANG to respond to the 9-11 attacks. The 121st Fighter Squadron is stationed at Andrews Air Force Base 
which is located 10 miles southeast of Washington, D.C. Most of its pilots are involved with the unit on only a part-time basis while flying commercial jet planes to their civilian, in their civilian lives. Therefore, according to author Lynn Spencer, on 9-11, most of the 121st Fighter Squadron's pilots will be, quote, back at their airline jobs, having just returned three days before from two weeks of a large-scale training exercise, Red Flag, at Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas. The squadron has only seven pilots available, end quote. In addition, some of the pilots will need to have their flight data disks reprogrammed before they can launch um, between 9.05 a.m. and 11 a.m. on 9.11. Pilot Heather Penny Garcia will reportedly be, quote, busy reprogramming flight data disks, which will, will still contain all of the Nellis data from the red flag training exercise they just returned from, end quote. Um, so that's, you know, an indication that maybe those red flags had a little something to do with the response or the lack of response. But well, the problem, the, the problem, is the, 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 okay, but see, the way that the military operates, they're completely aware of who's going where and when and those duties uh, wouldn't have been that unit's responsibility. It would have been somebody else's. If they had been out of the loop, uh, out of their immediate area due to training and all that, they wouldn't They wouldn't be on call anyway. So their readiness or lack of readiness in this situation wouldn't affect the general readiness overall. They wouldn't have been expected to perform any in any capacity at that time uh, except for, you know, everybody – run for the base, we're going to war, you know. <laughs> well, the thing about the the military exercises is that there were a multitude of them taking place um, on 9-11. And the 9-11 report only mentions one of them, and it's in a footnote in the back of the book. And the footnote says, on 9-11, NORAD was scheduled to conduct a military exercise, Vigilant Guardian which postulated a bomber attack from the former Soviet Union. We investigated whether military preparations for the large-scale exercise compromised the military's response to the real-world terrorist attacks on 9-11. According to General Eberhardt, quote, it took almost, it took about 30 seconds, end quote, to make the adjustment to the real-world situation. Ralph Eberhardt testimony, uh, June 17, 2004, uh, said, we found that the response was, if anything, expedited by the increased number of staff at sectors at NORAD because of the scheduled exercise. And it says, see Robert Marr interview. Yes, so, probably would have all been talking to each other, and it would, yeah, I, yeah, that makes sense to me. And what didn't happen doesn't. Well, okay, so the 9-11 report uh, covers Vigilant Guardian. Uh, but it doesn't cover Northern Vigilance. It doesn't cover Global Guardian. It doesn't cover Amalgam Warrior, um, which were all taking place that day. So the question is, did the military exercises cause confusion? And I grabbed a lot of this from an, an article called Real World or Exercise. Did the U.S. military mistake the 9-11 attacks for a training scenario? And this is from Shoestring, and it was written March 22nd, 2012. He's a contributor to HistoryCommons.org. From the outset, personnel at Meads wondered if reports they received about the 9-11 attacks were part of the exercise. Their first notification of the crisis came just before 8.38 a.m. on September 11th when Joseph Cooper, an air traffic controller at the FAA's Boston Center, called Needs and reported, quote, we have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New York and we need someone to scramble some F-16s or something up there. Help us out, end quote. The response of the technical sergeant, Jeremy Powell, who answered the call was to ask, quote, is this real world or exercise, end quote. Cooper replied, no, this is not an exercise, not a test, end quote. 
According to Vanity Fair, quote, Powell, like most, almost everyone in the room, first assumes the phone call is from the simulations team on hand to send inputs, simulated scenarios into play for the day's training exercise, end quote. At 9.03, Needs received a phone call informing it that a second aircraft had been hijacked and personnel also saw the live television coverage of the second plane, Flight 175 crashing into the World Trade Center. A minute or two later, recordings of the operations floor reveal several members of staff discussed these developments among themselves. One of them asked, quote, is this explosion part of, the, uh, part of that that we're looking at now on TV? Someone replied, yes, and there's a possible second hijack, also the United Airlines, end quote. Another person then commented, quote, I think this is a damn input, to be honest. An input is a, a simulations input as part of a training exercise. Someone else said, quote, then this is a damn messed up input, end quote. Oh. Um, at 9.09, .09, one of the needs ID technicians complained, quote, I hope they cancel the exercise because this is ridiculous, end quote. Then at 9.15, an off-duty member of staff called in and asked someone in the ID section about the exercise. They said, quote, I've been watching the news for about 10 minutes, and I said, quote, I wonder if, the, if they're, did they suspend the exercise, end quote. The person that needs answers, quote, not at this time, no, but I think they're going to, end quote. He then laughed and added, quote, I don't know. At around 9.20, one of the ID technicians commented, quote, this was pre-planned, I bet, for 9 o'clock, end quote. A colleague of hers replies, quote, oh, I bet it, you it was, end quote. At 10.08, Master Sergeant Joe McCain, the mission crew commander technician, responded to Master Sergeant Maureen Dooley, the leader of the ID section. After... Um, she provided details of a bomb that was being reported on United Airlines Flight 93, the fourth hijacked airplane, uh, which supposedly crashed in Pennsylvania that morning. McCain commented, quote, if this is an exercise input, this is a good one, end quote. That was a 10 um, Author Lynn Spencer described that moment writing, quote, more with has participated in enough training missions to know this is something out of the ordinary. Clearly, he thinks the CIMEX, the simulated exercise, is kicking off with a lively, unexpected twist. His bet is that his simulations team has started off the exercise by throwing out a heart attack card to see how the troops respond to a first aid call from a fellow soldier, testing their first responder tra uh, training, end quote. Major General Larry Arnold, the commander of the Continental United States NORAD region on September 11th, has recalled that when he was informed of the first hijacking, the first thing he thought was, quote, is this part of the exercise? Is this some kind of screw-up? End quote. Um, Nassipani has said, quote, when they told me there was a hijack, my first reaction was, somebody started the exercise early. End quote. Nassipani knew that the exercise was scheduled to include a simulated hijacking. And so he recalled, he actually said out loud, the hijack's not supposed to be for another hour, end quote. Audio recordings reveal that around 9 a.m. on September 11th, Nassipani joked with his colleagues about what happened when Meads was alerted to the first hijacking of American Airlines Flight 11. He said, quote, and where was I? I was on the shitter, end quote. He continued, when I heard it was like, oh my God, he added, I knew that that was an exercise, end quote. Recordings of the operations floor reveal that at 8.57, around 20 minutes after Needs was alerted to the first hijacking, Kevin Nassipani was discussing the first plane hitting the World Trade Center with a colleague. He then joked, uh, quote, Think we put the exercise on hold? What do you think? And laughed heartily. At 8.43 a.m., while needs personnel were busy responding to the reported hijacking of Flight 11, James Fox commented, quote, 
I've never seen so much real-world stuff happen during an exercise, end quote. Robert Moore, too, appears to have understood real world to be a term that is used to describe a live fly exercise event. When he saw personnel on the operations floor gathered around a radar scope, after they learned of the first hijacking, Moore sent Dawn Deskins to find out what was happening. After Deskins then learned about the hijacking, she returned to the Needs Battle Cab and reportedly told Moore, quote, it's a hijacking. And this is real life, not part of the exercise, end quote. According to the account of Lynn Spencer, which was presumably based on an interview with Moore, Moore then thought, quote, this is an interesting start to the exercise. This real world mixed in with today's Simex will keep them on their toes, end, end quote. So those are all of the accounts that I collected from that article that indicated that there was some confusion about the exercises that day. What do you think? I think that within the units participating in the exercises, there's probably been quite a bit of confusion between the two. But the, it seems like they were at least attempting to get a handle on which it was, which they're supposed to do. Um, right. You know, we always... But, he, we, but I, I guess, you know, the the confusion seems to have been apparent, uh, that still shouldn't have stopped them from flying. Well, what happened was General Ralph Eberhardt told the 9-11 Commission that, quote, the situation that you're referring to, I think, at most cost us 30 seconds. And the the situation that he was referring to was that first quote about real world or exercise. Was this real world or exercise? But as you could see throughout the attacks, there were other quotes about whether or not this was an ex you know was this an exercise so Ralph Eberhardt really only addressed one of those um, seemingly confusions now yeah yeah and and I get that i mean what he what he said was that you know or what we just talked about uh, what you just read showed that somebody sent the communication. The person who received it confirmed the status of it, and that should have dictated, you know, what came next. It looks like if some of what you said seems like some of the same people who got the response then went on thinking it was an exercise anyway, which really right. confuses me. <laughs> that doesn't exactly. Make sense and at all. now look at now look at the 9/11 Commission and what they investigated. They only mentioned one of the exercises that day. See, to me, whatever the 9-11 Commission omits becomes an area of interest. So, I can see how that would, yes, yes, that, that would follow. So anyway, I'm going to read a little uh, paragraph from Richard Clark's book, uh, Against All Enemies, and right. this is apparently at 928. According to his account, during a video conference with top officials that he is directing, uh, Counterterrorism czar Richard Clark asks Acting Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman Richard Myers, quote, I assume NORAD has scrambled fighters and AWACS. How many? Where? Uh, end quote. Myers, who is at the Pentagon, replies, quote, Not a pretty picture, Dick. We are in the middle of Vigilant Warrior, a NORAD exercise. But Otis has launched two birds towards New York. Langley is trying to get two up now toward Washington. The AWACs are at a tinker and not on the alert, end quote. Uh, vigilant Warrior may be, may be a mistaken reference to either the ongoing war game Vigilant Guard, Guardian or perhaps another exercise called Amalgam Warrior. So there's Richard Clark on a tele, uh, you know, according to him, on a teleconference with Myers, and Myers says, not a pretty picture, Dick. We are in the middle of Vigilant Warrior, a NORAD exercise. Now, doesn't that seem like that the, the war games might have caused the problem based on what uh, Clark is saying Myers said? Well, I think that um, it's possible. I'm not being an Air Force guy. I don't really know how they station these outfits, you know. 
but once again, when you have a training schedule, you're supposed to uh, allocate for your real-world mission regardless. Uh, when you're an operational unit, you have an operational responsibility. You're supposed to, and uh, they may not have, and this may be what he's referring to, but you know, they may not have scheduled sufficient resources to actually respond to what would have normally been a normal day's activity. Um, right. Which would have been a dreadful mistake, and somebody needs to answer for that. Uh, yep. You know, so the the whatever excuses that they keep giving that you that you're you know reading to me one, these one at a time, each one of them has this kind of element to it where you could buy that on a one time, you know, oops. But under the circumstances <laughs> and in this context, it doesn't wash. Well, that's what Mindy Kleiberg said in her her statement that I read. You know, one time, you know, yeah. but how many times? Now, yeah. I'm going to read. Um, Cynthia McKinney actually tried to get answers about these military exercises on two separate yeah, occasions. Bless her heart. I'm going to read uh, both accounts. On uh, February 25, 2005, then Representative Cynthia McKinney asked Donald Rumsfeld about the exercises that were taking place on 9/11 but did not get an answer on that day. On March 10, 2005, Representative McKinney asked Donald Rumsfeld and General Richard Myers about the exercises again. The first question asked by Representative McKinney was, quote, whether or not the activities of the four war games going on September 11th actually impaired our ability to respond to the attacks, end quote. General Myers responded with, quote, the answer to the question is no did not impair our response. In fact, General Eberhardt, who was in the command of the North American Aerospace Defense Command, as he testified in front of the 9-11 Commission, I believe, I believe he told them that it, was, that it enhanced our ability to respond, end quote. Then Representative McKinney asked, quote, who was in charge of managing those war games, end quote, and was cut off by Representative Duncan Hunter, General Myers never gave a name, but he did say, quote, North American Aerospace Defense Command was responsible, end quote. She was promised an answer in writing, and as far as I know, she never received it. And so, all right, so the next question is, um, what, what, what are injects or SIMs, and did they affect our response that morning? Um, and what I got was an article from Shoestring um, called Let's Get Rid of This Goddamn Sim, How NORAD Radar Screens Displayed False Tracks All Through the 9-11 Attacks. And this was written on August 12, 2010. There's only two paragraphs, so that's good. At 9.30 a.m. that morning, a member of staff on the needs operations floor complained about simulated material that was appearing on Needs radar screens. He said, quote, you know what? Let's get rid of this goddamn SIM. Turn your SIM switches off. Let's get rid of that crap, end quote. Four minutes later, Technical Sergeant Jeffrey uh, Richmond gave an instruction to the Needs surveillance technicians, quote, all surveillance, turn off your SIM switches, end quote. And in parentheses, he says, a SIM switch presumably allows a technician to either display or turn off any simulated material on their radar screens, in parentheses. At 10.12 a.m., an officer at the NORAD Operations Center, uh, Captain Taylor, called Needs and spoke to Captain Brian Nagel, the chief of live exercises there. Introduced, after introducing himself, Taylor said, quote, what we need you to do right now is to terminate all exercise inputs coming into Cheyenne Mountain in End quote. Nagel gave Taylor an extension number and asked him to call it to get the exercise input stopped. Taylor replied, quote, I'll do that. Uh, inputs, according to an article in Vanity Fair, are simulated scenarios that are put into play um, a simulations team during training exercises. So all throughout 9-11, there were fake blips and injects and simulations simulations on their radar screens. What do you think about that? Well, I, I think that 
if you're talking about an operational unit mixing notional and real world at the same time, if they haven't set it up so they can just look at the display and tell that it's a sim, then I don't know what they've been doing all these years. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, honestly, it's such a no-brainer, but, hey, maybe they didn't do that, okay? Because, you know, you're asking the not experts so we can speculate like crazy. Right, um, exactly. <laughs> but it seems but like... I mean, you know, what what reason is there for that to be possible? Think about that. Why in the world would you allow your inputs to be so indistinguishable, exercise right. from real world, when you're talking about actually putting people in the air and actually keeping people from crashing. Right. What um, the hell is that? I don't, you know, maybe there's good explanation for something like that, but I don't know what it is. I, I don't know what it is either. Um, okay. What time was a CAP, Combat Air Patrol, formed over New York City? Do you know? Well, it depends. Sometimes caps are continuous, depending upon threat levels. Um, you know, I know a little. I know that much about it. Not a whole hell of a lot more. But you can have cap patrols up for weeks on end if your tensions are high. So, you know, what was the alert level at the time? What were they well, supposed to be doing? According to the 9/11 Commission, the two fighters launched from Otis Air Force Base arrive over Manhattan at 9.25 after exiting their holding pattern off the Long Island coast at 9.13. They then establish a combat air patrol over New, York, over New York. The commission bases this conclusion on its analysis of FAA radar data and interviews with two Otis pilots, Daniel Nash and Timothy McDuffie, or Timothy Duffy. Now, there are conflicting accounts about this. Um, according to the accounts of numerous witnesses on the ground near the World Trade Center, military fighter jets are first noti noticed flying over Manhattan either shortly before or soon after the second collapse. At 1028, some witnesses recall fighters arriving just before this collapse. Um, emergency medical technician Dolce McGorgie and Michael D'Angelo hear fighters flying over Manhattan at unspecified times after the first towers collapse. Lieutenant Sean O'Malley and firefighters Pete Gutetti and Dan Potter noticed jet fighters flying overhead soon before the second collapse. Other witnesses say the fighters arrived soon after this collapse, the second collapse. Deputy Fire Chief Robert Brown, police officer Peter Moog, and emergency medical technicians Richard Zarillo and Jason Katz notice fighters overhead immediately after, or fairly soon after, the second tower's collapse. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Rudolph Giuliani, the police commissioner Bernard Carrick, and Office of Emergency Management Director Richard Shire are heading north together after leaving their temporary command post on Barclay Street. In some accounts, all three of them recollect hearing the first military jets overheard soon after the second tower's collapse. However, according to another account, Giuliani hears the first jet slightly earlier at around 10.20. And in his private testimony before the 9-11 Commission, Carrick claims to have heard a fighter jet coming when he was heading to the temporary command post on Barclay Street, i.e. shortly before 9.50 a.m. Based on the recording, um, now, I have two two pieces of, I guess, evidence. <laughs> um, if you listen to Howard Stern's broadcast that morning, he's talking to different people throughout the city on their phones. And if you uh -huh. listen to, to his um, recording that morning, you'll hear that fighters don't arrive until after the first tower collapses. Um, and then... I don't recommend this movie promoting this movie at all because it talks a lot of, about a lot of speculative bullshit. But there's a movie out there called 9-11 Eyewitness, which has footage of the buildings that morning as things progressed. And you did not hear fighter jets over the skies of New York City 
until after the first tower collapsed, which coincides with, with Howard Stern's show that morning. So that's about 10.09, I guess, that the fighters arrived over the skies of New York City. Compare that to the 9.25 timeline of the 9-11 Commission, and it, it's, it's a huge discrepancy. That's like a 45-minute discrepancy. Wow. Well, I so, can begin to explain that. Um, you know, what what is the the hard data say? You know, people's recollections and in stuff as an aggregate are, are indicative, but they're well, not really evidence. As, as I showed, some people's accounts show that, you know, fighter jets, according to them, didn't arrive until either after the first tower collapsed or after the second tower collapsed, which was long after the 925 assumed timeline uh, by the 9-11 Commission. So... I don't... But, I can't explain that. It's definitely something that needs explaining. It, it's just a huge discrepancy. It and, is. It's <laughs> gigantic. You could drive a truck through it. Somebody needs to fix that. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, all right, let's continue along. When were shoot-down orders issued and how were they received by fighter pilots? Do you know? Well, the, they it. were usually issued after contact had been made and and after uh, they'd attempted to communicate and, and that kind of thing. It usually, I think there's an assessment period before you just blaze things down, and then you've got to get separate authorization. You don't arrive on the scene usually with shoot-down orders. Uh, that's well, shoot-down orders are like the last resort. Kind of thing. Yeah, you know, it's the last thing that happens. I mean, you you go, you look, you try to communicate, you know, et cetera. It, it, and you know, and you, that doesn't even if, even if they don't communicate with you, that doesn't mean shoot them down. That just means that you've got a situation you don't know what it is yet. If something gets dangerous about what's going on, then you might start talking about shooting down. But it's not the first thing that pops in, you know. That it's not like it's not like a traffic stop in Albuquerque. <laughs> right, exactly. According to Major ja uh, Daniel Nash, pilot of one of the two fighters first scrambled on 9/11 at 8:52 a.m., their fighters over New York City are never given shoot-down orders by the military that day. Um, that's according to Major Daniel Nash. At 10.18, according to White House logs, Cheney calls Bush, who is on board Air Force One, and speaks with him for two minutes. White House Press Secretary Ari Fleischer notes that at 10.20 a.m., Bush informs him that he has authorized the shoot-down of aircraft, if necessary. However, as the commission will later note, quote, among the sources that reflect other important events that morning, there is no documentary evidence for this call. Although the relevant sources are incomplete, end quote. Reportedly, some members of the commission staff will not believe this call between Bush and Cheney ever took place. Cheney phones Bush at 10:18. According to the 9/11 Commission, it is in fact during that call that Bush authorizes the military to shoot down threatening aircraft. At 10.31 a.m., according to the 9-11 Commission, NORAD Commander Major General Larry Arnold instructs his staff to broadcast the following message over a NORAD chat log. Quote, 10.31, Vice President Cheney has cleared us to intercept tracks of inner interest and shoot them down if they do not respond per con RCC, General Arnold, end quote. Needs first learns of the shoot-down order from this message. However, Needs does not pass the order to the fighter pilots in New York City and Washington. Needs, le Needs leaders later say they do not pass it on because they are unsure how the pilots should proceed with this guidance. Um, quote, Cheney testified to the 9-11 Commission that he spoke with President Bush before giving an order to shoot down and hijack a civilian airliner that appeared headed toward Washington. Uh, in parentheses, the plane was United 93, which crashed in the Pennsylvania field after a brave revolt by passengers, uh, in parentheses. But a source close to the commission had declined to be 
identified revealing sensitive information says that none of the staffers who worked on this aspect of the investigation believe Cheney's versions of events. A draft, oh, this is from a report from uh, uh, MB, MSNBC. A draft of the report conveyed their skepticism. When top White House officials, including Chief of, Chief of Staff Andy Clark and then White House Counsel Alberto Gonzalez reviewed the draft, they became extremely agitated. After a prolonged battle, the report was toned down. The factual narrative, closely read, offers no evidence that Cheney sought initial authorization from the president. The point is not a small one. Legally, Cheney was required to get permission from his commander-in-chief, who was traveling but reachable at the time. If the public ever found out that Cheney gave the order on his own, it would have strongly fed the view that he was the real power behind the throne. Um, and that is from MSNBC, and the article is called The Shot Heard Round the World, and that took place on February 27, 2006. Um, let's see. Okay, quote, in his bunker under the White House, Vice President Cheney was not notified about United 93 until 10.02, only one minute before the airliner impacted to the ground. Yet it was with dark bravado that the Vice President and others in the Bush administration would later recount sober deliberations about the prospect of shooting down the United 93. Quote, very, very tough decision, and the President understood the magnitude of that decision. Bush's then Chief of Staff Andrew Card told the ABC News. Cheney echoed, quote, the significance of saying to a pilot that you were authorized to shoot down a plane full of Americans is, you know, it's an order that has never been given before, and it wasn't on 9-11 either, uh, apparently. President Bush would finally grant commanders the authority to give that order at 10:18, which, though no one knew it at the time, was 15 minutes after the attack was over. But comments such as these above were reported by other administration and military figures in the weeks and months following 9/11, forging the notion that only the passengers counterattack against their hijackers prevented an inevitable shootdown of United 93. And all of that is from an article called 9-11 Live, the NORAD Tapes, from Vanity Fair, August 2006. So basically, there's a question about when uh, or if Dick Cheney even talked to Bush and gave directions to shoot down airliners that day. The, the vice president has no power. Okay, his power is to break ties in the Senate and to take over in the event that the president is killed. He has no power other than that. Mm -hmm. So, so if there's a big question, if he gave a shoot down authorization without the president's authority, you know, he overstepped his bounds that day. Well, places an interesting uh, chain of responsibility shift, doesn't it? Yep. Because, um, it, you know, actually, under that structure, anybody who obeyed the order would be at least in questionable territory. Right. Now, how did, the next question, how did the 9-11 Commission deal with the lies they were being told by both the FAA and NORAD? And, let's see. I believe I grabbed this from History Commons. In the spring of 2004, quote, after finding the FAA and U.S. military officials have made a string of false statements to them about the air defense on the day of the attacks and have withheld key documents for months, the 9-11 Commission staff proposes a criminal investigation by the Justice Department into those officials, end quote. Quote, the proposal is contained in a memo sent by the, the commission team investigating the day of the attacks to Philip Zelikow, the commission's executive director. However, nothing much is done with the memo for months. 
A similar proposal will, leave, will then be submitted to the very last meeting of the 9-11 commissioners who decide to refer the matter not to the Justice Department but to the Inspector General of the Pentagon and the FAA. Whereas the Justice Department could bring criminal charges for perjury if it is found they were warranted, the Inspector General cannot. According to John Azzarello, a commission staffer behind the proposal, Zelikow fails to act on the proposal for weeks. Azzarello will say that Zelikow, who has friends at the Pentagon, quote, just buried that memo, end quote. Azzarello's account will be backed by commission team leader John Farmer. However, Zelikow will say that Azzarello was not party to all the discussions about what to do and what that memo was and that the memo was delayed by other commission staffers, not him. Zelikow's version will receive backing from the commission's lawyer, Daniel Marcus. So there's a conflicting account there about you know when things were acted upon and so forth. But the end result is they did not refer it to the Justice Department where they could be held accountable. They held it to a corrupt, as we already pointed out, Inspector General, where they would be let off the hook, which they were. Yeah, it, it, it's obvious. It's an obvious cover-up maneuver. Um, and once again, this and all the other several hundred uh, tells or little red flags um, have been ignored uh, by this commission. And some of them, they even say themselves, look, we would love to have ran that down, but nobody will will help us. Well, I... I you mean and that's, that's probably... Yeah, that's probably just a convenient excuse, but it, the fact is that there were people, agencies, that stonewalled the commission. So even if they had had all the right intentions from top to bottom, they still didn't have everything they needed. Well, you just brought up a good point, that they were stonewalled. Um, at some point, the 9-11 Commission, uh, well, they were given the power of subpoena, but they rarely used it, and I think they only used it for the FAA and NORAD. Um, now, in late October, early November, and this is from History Commons, Following the discovery that NORAD is withholding extremely important evidence from the 9-11 Commission, John Farmer, the leader of the Commission team investigating the day of 9-11, and the Commission's Executive Director, Philip Zelikow, discussed subpoenaing the Pentagon. In the first meeting, Zelikow seems to support Farmer's demand that a, the, that a subpoena be issued, but is, quote, hard to read, according to Farmer. Farmer then returns to New York, where he is based for his work on the 9-11 on the commission. According to Farmer, he receives an urgent phone call from Daniel Marcus, the commission's counsel, telling him that Zelikow is trying to derail the subpoena and that Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld is to meet with the commissioners to dissuade them. Such a meeting will actually be held one day before the commission votes on the subpoena. In Farmer's account, Marcus says, quote, You'd better get down here. It's all unraveling. Philip is undoing this, end quote, Philip Zelikow. Marcus will later say he d does not recall this call, but will say that Zelikow, who was close to members of Rumsfeld's staff, would even, quote, flaunt, end quote, his good relations with Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence Stephen Cambone. Zelikow will later make a successful last-ditch bid to prevent a subpoena being issued on the White House, according to Farmer, who returns to Washington and together with Dana Hyde, one of his staffers confronts Zelikow. Hyde complains, quote, we can't do our job if you frustrate us, end quote. Farmer adds, quote, I thought you were supporting the subpoena. Now I hear otherwise. What's going on, end quote. He demands he be allowed to address the commissioners on the subpoena, but Zelikow replies, quote, I represent the staff. I will represent your views, end quote. According to author Philip Sheenan, Zelikow's face, quote, turns the crimson color that the staff in Washington have seen before in moments of his most extreme rage, end quote. Zelikow then says, quote, 
It's beyond our pay, pay grade at this point, end quote. Farmer disagrees and storms out of Zelikow's office. Zelikow will confirm that there was a difference of opinion with Farmer on the matter. Quote, we did have concerns about timing and tactics. Tension was building to a breaking point, end quote. However, Zelikow will say he did not necessarily oppose the subpoena as he shared Farmer's concerns about the Pentagon's truthfulness. Marcus will back Zelikow, saying that he thinks Zelikow did not try to derail the subpoena because of his friendship with Can Bone or for any other reason. So there are conflicting accounts about the subpoena. Um, now, Lee Hamilton, are you familiar with him? I don't know much about him. I know the name. That's about all, and I'm not sure why I do. He's someone who should not have been anywhere near the 9-11 Commission. He was good friends with Dick King and Donald Rumsfeld. He helped to cover up the Iran Contra affair. He helped to cover up the October surprise inquiry um, thing that happened. And this is how Lee Hamilton uh, dealt with the subpoenas. On November 5th, Lee Hamilton, Vice Chairman of the 9-11 Commission, makes an 11th hour visit to the Pentagon in an attempt to avert a subpoena, some of the commission want to file on the Defense Department over documents NORAD was, is withholding from the 9-11 Commission. At the Pentagon, Hamilton meets Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, his deputy, Paul Wolfowitz, and Under Secretary for Intelligence, Stephen Cambone. Hamilton takes with him Slade Gordon, a Republican member of the commission who was inclined towards issuing the subpoena. It is unclear who initiated and arranged the meeting, some staffers who want the subpoena issued will accuse Philip Zelikow, the commission's executive director, of setting it up as a part of a wider effort to thwart the subpoena. However, Zelikow will later say he does not recall having anything to do with the meeting. At the meeting, Rumsfeld is, according to author Philip Sheenan, quote, charming and agreeable, end quote, and insists he is unaware of the problems between the commission and NORAD. He, re he vows to resolve the issues and promises that any evidence that has been withheld until now will be turned over immediately. Therefore, he says, there is no need for a subpoena. Hamilton, who was initially rejected for the vice chairmanship of the commission because of his links to Rumsfeld and other Republicans and who sometimes takes the current administration's side in internal commission debates, thinks this is the end of the matter. Quote, I've known Don Rumsfeld for 20, 30 years, he tells the other commissioners. Quote, when he said, I'm going to get that information for you, I took him at his word, end quote. Gordon's attitude is different. Quote, I was outraged with NORAD and the way they had operated, end quote. Thinking false statements NORAD officials provided to the commission may have been made knowingly, he will add, quote, even if it wasn't intentional, it was just so grossly negligent and incompetent, end quote. The commission will vote to issue the subpoena the next day with Hamilton against and Gorton for it. So Lee Hamilton, it seems that Philip Zelikow and Lee Hamilton tried to save the day with regards to the subpoena, but there are conflicting accounts about that. Yeah, most of the conflicts sound like uh, I forgot, so... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think uh, I, I, I don't there's not much weight to those <laughs> right exactly so um, the next question is what are some quotes about the FAA and or its response that morning from people like Tom Keene and, and John Farmer and I just want to point out that Senator Mark Dayton um he confronted uh, Thomas Keene, Lee Hamilton on one occasion, Philip Zelikow on another occasion. I think he confronted Donald Rumsfeld and Richard Myers on another occasion. On four separate occasions, Senator Mark Dayton questioned people uh, from the military and from the 9-11 Commission about NORAD's lies. And there's a transcript of the first time he did it that's available at 911truth.org. And I just want to point that out for people because it's a lot of stuff to read through. Um, so we're just going to read through 
um, these quotes. Here are some excerpts from Thomas Keene and Lee Hamilton's book, Without Precedent. Quote, there were also discrepancies between things NORAD was telling us about their performance on the morning of September 11, things that the agency had stated publicly after 9-11, and the story told by the limited tapes and documents the commission had received, end quote. These were puzzling and disturbing developments, and they account in part for some of the more bizarre and inaccurate conspiracy theories about 9-11, end quote. Quote, Farmer believed that NORAD was delivering incomplete records with the knowledge that the commission had a fixed end date that could be waited out, end quote. Quote, Throughout the course of our inquiry, the topic that invited the most skepticism and thus the most conspiracy theorizing was the performance of the FAA and NORAD on the day of September 11, 2001, end quote. Quote, a fog of war could explain why some people were confused on the day of 9-11, but it could not explain why all of the after-action reports, accident investigations, and pu public testimony by FAA and NORAD officials advanced an account of 9-11 that was untrue, end quote. Uh, John Farmer, Jr., senior counsel to the commission, stated that the commission, quote, discovered that what government and military officials had told Congress, the commission, the media, and the public about who knew what when was almost entirely and inexplicably untrue, end quote. Mm -hmm. uh, Farmer continues, quote, at some level of the government, at some point in time, there was a decision, decision not to tell the truth about what happened. The NORAD tapes told a radically different story from what had been told to us and the public, end quote. Uh, Thomas Keene, the head of the 9-11 Commission, concurred, quote, we to this day don't know why NORAD told us what they told us. It was just so far from the truth, end quote. Uh, Ken Merchant, who is a NORAD or NORAD's Joint Exercise Design Manager, will tell the 9-11 Commission in 2003 that he cannot, quote, Remember a time in the last 33 years when NORAD has not run a hijacked exercise, end quote. Yeah. So the, those are some quotes. What do you have to say about that? Well, I, I uh, find it amazing that with so many people in official capacity saying these things that nothing's been done about them. Right. It, it just... It's a complete, it's a, it's a complete mind blower, you know. I mean, it's presupposing any uh, ability of of the people within these agencies to actually respond properly at this point. I mean, there's so much regulatory capture within the industrial regulation agencies, and there's, uh, the Pentagon pretty much does what it wants. Look at all that money they spent on the fighter that the pilots continue to say is absolutely worthless. Uh, thing right. like this, uh, it's it, it's uh, is it infuriating for you? Yeah, well, of course it's infuriating. So many things are. Uh, if we it, once again, it, it seems like if these things, I'm losing my, I'm actually losing my ability to string words together at this point because it, 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 it I'm trying to say the same thing differently. You know, right. Okay, I get you. Well, let me know. let me go. Let me read these two statements from the September 11th advocates, the Jersey uh -huh. Girls. Um, when the monograph was released about the FAA receiving 52 warnings, this is the statement that they released, and this is the September 11th advocate statement. Re 9/11 Commission's declassified monograph on FAA failures and it was released on February 11, 2005. September 11 was neither an intelligence failure nor was it a failure of imagination. It was nonfeasance on behalf of a whole host of government agencies, including the FAA. Of the 105 warnings issued, 52 warnings regarding Al-Qaeda were given to the FAA by the intelligence community in a six-month period from April 2001 to September 2001. 
According to the 9-11 Commission's final report, there were eight information circulars put out by the FAA between July 2nd and September 10th, 2001. Five of these information circulars targeted overseas threats, while the remaining three targeted domestic threats. The 52 threats regarding al-Qaeda were not received by the FAA in a vacuum. From March 2001 to September 2001, according to the Joint Inquiry of Congress, our intelligence community received at least 41 specific threats of a possible domestic attack by al-Qaeda. Additionally, the FAA was also made aware of the August 16, 2001 arrest of Zacharias Musawi. Finally, the FAA attended a high-level meeting on July 5, 2001, where the domestic threat posed by al-Qaeda was discussed by all relevant intelligence agencies. According to the newly released FAA monograph, in the spring of 2001, the FAA knew that if, quote, the intent of the hijacker is not to exchange hostages for prisoners, but to commit suicide in a spectacular explosion, a domestic hijacking would probably be preferable, end quote. The aforementioned statement is yet another indicator of how widely known it was in the national security community that al-Qaeda was interested in using planes as missiles. Yet, as the historic record also widely indicates, former National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice publicly stated that she didn't think anyone could imagine that planes could be used as missiles. Furthermore, Ms. Rice also... I'm sorry, go ahead. I said insert more screaming here, sorry. <laughs> Furthermore, Ms. Rice... <laughs> Um, also testified under oath before the 9-11 Commission that the August 6, 2001 PDB, the Laden determined to strike in the U.S., contained purely historical threat information. The revelation of the 52 warnings given to FAA during the same time period would seem to indicate that Ms. Rice perjured herself during her testimony. Moreover, Ms. Rice also testified that there was nothing more the U.S. government could have done during the summer of 2001 to thwart the attacks of 9-11. Yet the newly released 9-11 monograph states that the Federal Air Marshal Program was specifically deleted from all domestic flights during the summer of 2001 as a result of cost-cutting by the airlines. Certainly, placing air marshals on domestic flights as well within the purview of Ms. Rice's own responsibilities and tasking as National Security Advisor. Why has she not been held accountable? Additionally, why has no one in the airline community been held accountable? An FAA spokesperson asserts that the FAA didn't have specific information regarding means or methods that would have enabled them to tailor any countermeasures. This statement clearly contradicts the reality detailed in this report. Stepping up security in the face of terror warnings is not a new concept for America's government agencies. The FAA testified before the 9-11 Commission that during the millennium, an unknown terror plot caused them to ratchet up their security procedures. With 52 warnings, why was this not done in 2001? The American public must not be lulled into a false sense of security. While government reports might allege that the myriad of government agencies, individuals, and institutions that failed our nation on 9-11 have been fixed post-9-11, the disturbing fact remains that after all of the failures of 9-11 have been revealed, far too many of the same individuals who were unable to react appropriately to clear and abundant warnings, to clear and abundant warnings are still in their positions today. Notably missing from this monograph is any information pertaining to NORAD's failure to timely scramble jets, which leads us to wonder what else is being withheld from the public. And that was from the September 11th Advocates, Kristen Bratweiser, Patty Casaza, Monica Gabrielle, Mindy Kleinberg, and Lori Van Alken. Mm -hmm. Now in 2006, or August 2006, when it was revealed that the 9-11 Commission referred consider referring NARAD to the Justice Department for a criminal investigation. Um, there was a statement released by the September 11th Advocates um, Friday, August 4th, 2006. 
and it says, Mandate of the 9-11 Commission. The 9-11 Inde Independent Commission was established by law to, quote, ascertain, evaluate, and report on the evidence developed by all rel relevant governmental agencies regarding the facts and circumstances surrounding the attacks, to make a full and complete accounting of the circumstances surrounding the attacks, and the extent of the United States' preparedness for an immediate response to the attacks, end quote. Recent stories in the Washington Post, the New York Times, as well as the release of transcripts of the NORAD tapes in Vanity Fair, clearly show that the 9-11 Commission failed in its duties. According to current reports, the Commission knew it had been deceived by NORAD. In May 2003, representatives of NORAD testified in full regalia before the 9-11 Commission, equipped with an easel and visual aids to highlight NORAD's timeline for the day of 9-11. In June 2004, NORAD testified again, changing its previous testimony. The new timeline blamed the lack of military response on late notification by the FAA. The commissioners never determined or explained why there was a discrepancy between the two sets of testimonies. Governor Keene is quoted in, in the Washington Post article as saying, quote, we to this day don't know why NORAD told us what they told us. It was just so far from the truth. It's one of those loose ends that never got tied, end quote. The fact that the commission did not see fit to tie up all loose ends in their final report or to hold those who came before them accountable for lying and or making misleading statements puts into question the veracity of the entire commission's report. Individuals who came before the commission to testify after NORAD's appearance had no reason to state the truth. It was abundantly clear that there would be no repercussions for any misrepresentations. Furthermore, the lack of tenacity and curiosity by the commissioners themselves to determine why NORAD had deceived them is unconscionable. Knowing full well that the lack of military response was such a critical failure begs the question of whether that same lack of tenacity and curiosity was applied to other critical areas of the 9-11 investigation. We fought to establish the 9-11 Independent Commission because we believe that American citizens would be better served if our nation's vulnerabilities were uncovered and then fixed. Unfortunately, once again, the failure to fully and properly investigate all areas, not follow all leads, and not address the need for accountability, whether it be bureaucrats lying at a hearing or personnel with questionable performance of assigned duties, continues to leave this nation and its citizens vulnerable and at risk. The 9-11 Commission was derelict in its duties. What we needed from them was a thorough investigation into the events of September 11th. Inexcusably, five years later, we still do. And that was written by Patty Casaza, Monica Gabrielle, Mindy Kleinberg, and Lori Van Auken. So, Malcolm, based on everything we went through, do you think we have a definitive story about the air response that morning? Huh. Not even close. Not even close. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we were lied to about 9-11. This is just another example of how we were lied to about 9-11. Yep. Um, and, and I'm sorry that I could not get an expert to go over this. I did the best that I could. Um, and well, Malcolm, I, I want to thank Malcolm for for being my guinea pig today. Um, You're welcome. Is there anything is there anything you'd like to say about all this? Well, um, I think that uh, what you've been saying all along has been true all along, and that is that you know we need a, a new investigation into all of this an independent investigation with subpoena powers and uh, the ability to, to file charges at a real live independent uh, investigative body instead of these put up jobs we keep getting handed. I believe the first try for the chairman was uh, Kissinger, was it? Yep. Yes, it yeah, was. Yeah. 
And people screamed so loud that they said, okay, 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 we were just kidding. We'll put in this other guy you don't know who's almost as bad. <laughs> right. But they, they also, it was reported that Keen could be easily controlled by the White House. So the whole 9-11 commission was just, just horrible. And it was this big slap in the face to the families, to everybody who lost someone that day, to everybody who was affected by that day, um, to everybody who died as a result as a result of the, how that day has been used. It's just just horrible. Yeah. And uh, anyway, is there anything that you would like to promote? Well, let's see. There's quite a few things coming up. Uh, in the the national on the national scene, one of the ones that springs to mind is the uh, the March convergence in D.C. I believe that uh, United National Anti-War Coalition and all its many many groups has has gotten behind this, and uh, there's going to be quite a quite a presence, you, from my understanding. You're talking about the Spring Rising. Yes, I am. I I saw. That that was coming on, and and that answer, and quite a few of the larger uh, coalition groups are all piling in. So it should be a pretty big weekend at the very worst. In, yep, it was started again. Something. It was started at, uh, by Cindy, and and everybody's jumping on board, and I can't go, and it breaks my heart because I broke uh, my back, and because I have to sit here, and it would just be so much. Pr- trouble to get me down there and, and I can't go and it ugh, gets yeah, me I hear you. It. I hear you well what you're doing there is important John like I said the persistence of you know the the questions and in, in the variety in and depth of, of, of them I mean there are so many different ways to come at this thing and say look there's another hole oh there's another one Holy cats, can you believe these people actually said this thing can float? <laughs> There's yep. just too many holes. It's yep. ridiculous. So we need to do something. But the the overall uh, picture right now is, is pretty bleak on the do something score if you're talking about trying to rein in this national, uh, this empire level stuff, you know, where we have power is in our own communities these days. And yeah, and it, it there. it's a it's a very rough situation, and um, you know, I focus on 9/11, but I focus on other issues as well, like Fukushima, which apparently has a new leak. Um, yes, as a matter of fact, thanks for bringing that up. That's something people ought to be aware of. There's uh, some apparently fairly credible looking news coming out right now, and and I expect it'll be more confirmed as time goes on that. Um, they have a new criticality in one of the uh, sunken cores. Uh, one of the reactor cores that melted is, is managed to uh, conglomerate in a large enough chunk that it has uh, it has started a nuclear reaction again, or at least that is what is being uh, being said. The uh, well, I know. I know that the West Coast is being hit with a lot of radiation from Fukushima. Yeah, it is. Uh, and But we've had some very... Uh, there's, there's a lot of things going on, and Fukushima is one of them. This recriticality is significant, but there are other incidents that have taken place just in recent history that we're struggling to explain. For example, in September of 2014, there was a wildfire in central Oregon that raised the background levels in the Willamette Valley because of the smoky haze and the particulates in it to five times the alert level for several days. And we're now trying to determine what that was. Thing is that just a couple months later, or a few months later, I'm a little foggy on the exact dates yet, there was another such incident in Bakersfield and their readings were several hundred times alert level, and we don't know why. So nuclear things are happening all around us. The uh, fact that nuclear plants give off a certain background level every time they're uh, 
refueled or just as they operate is something that most people don't know. It's called uh, permissible levels, but there is no safe level, so you just have a little less danger here, and a little, you know, but there's always some. Uh, well, the reason I brought up Fukushima was because during Toward the Peace, you know, Cindy would, would give her talk, and then I would give my talk about 9-11, and then Malcolm would start talking about Fukushima, which was a big topic at the time. And still so is, really. It still is, so I, that's why I brought it up. So, um, as a, an anti-nuclear person and somebody who's been watching Fukushima for some time, um, I think I'd like to bring up this event that's happening on March 11th. Uh, it's uh, being uh, the website is Fukushima2015.com. Uh, it's the fourth anniversary event in actually in London, but uh, there are events taking place all over the world and. If you uh, check around, you can see that it also has links for our friends in the USA. And then you can go to your city and see if you can join one of these events. Because as you know, the and we, we mentioned briefly, the plant uh, Fukushima uh, Daiichi has started another criticality, or we believe so at this time, uh, that uh, the uh, monitoring in, in the outflow from uh, the second reactor, reactor number two, where uh, the core is melted through, has had this huge increase in readings. Um, so it becomes even more important now than it has been, which is hugely, to, to keep this on our radar. So um, I'm encouraging people to get out there and, and learn what they can about the situation there and join in on calling the world's attention to uh, the need to do something about uh, monitoring uh, environmentally uh, water and food so that um, we know what's happening to us and uh, also to talk about solutions. Excellent. Okay, Malcolm, well, I want to thank you very much for taking the time today um, to go over this stuff, and I hope you learned something. I did. I know I did. Um, it, I learned that uh, the rabbit hole is even deeper than I thought, and I, it, I already knew it was pretty deep. <laughs> yep, yes it is. Well, thank you very much, Malcolm, and have a good day, and I hope good luck with everything you try to do in the future. You too, John. This is the, it was a good day. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Malcolm. Bye-bye. This show is dedicated to 9-11 victims Alan Kleinberg and John Casaza.